Good afternoon, morning or evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special Gwentleman talk show, because not only is it a patch week, but we have the lovely Rethas joining us. What up, Rethas? Hi. Thank oh. you for the nice introduction. <laughs> we also have Dylan, like Swim, but you know, nobody <laughs> cares about you guys. <laughs> They're only here for Rethas. And uh, this is an exciting week, like I say, because this is not only a patch, but we also have Rethas to talk a little bit about the patch, about Gwent in general. Uh, so I guess the first thing for you to do, Rethas, is to just introduce yourself to anyone who lives under a rock and might not know who you are and what you do for CD Projekt Red. Uh, so, yeah, my name, uh, as uh, you just introduced me, is Rethas, and I'm a developer on... Uh, Gwent, I work in the design area and I'm very involved in game balance and new features and various other things as well. And, you know, I've been involved in Gwent pretty much uh, from the start of its standalone version. I didn't work on it on The Witcher 3, but I have been pretty much from the start on uh, the standalone. Okay, and the standalone's been out for a year, so that is a long, long time of development. And uh, I guess... Just to start off with, we should get everyone's feels on the patch. So, Swim, how do you feel about that? <laughs> um, well, honestly, a, a lot of people have been kind of saying that it feels uh, like a bit of a half patch. It, it's actually been... I, I, I don't want to say underwhelming, and I don't honestly want to say disappointing either. Um, but it feels like it has been... It hasn't had the impact on the meta that typically uh, the 20 card patches have had in the past. Uh, and, and I know there are, there are actually reasons uh, for that. <laughs> there are reasons for that. <laughs> there are reasons. Well, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, you 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 guys have kind of alluded to uh, to reasons in in the last dev stream as well. I, I'm unsure exactly how much you're you're able to say about that. Oh, I think that uh, you know we're getting the game closer to what we feel is ready for release, and therefore there are less changes necessary. I mean, um, this community functions very much in extremes in terms of what's viable and what's not, and the reality is, as always, there are lots of things that are viable, and you know, I just wish more people would explore them. I'll use Unseen Elder as an example of that now. Like people are saying, you know, for the last patch that Unseen Elder was unplayable due to the nature of uh, him being high points, etc. Unseen Elder is the most played monster leader by a significant margin now, and it's you know sure there are some new cards to add consume, but the core mechanics of him hasn't really changed, and he was perfectly viable last patch, and there are and were people that were playing him, and he's perfectly viable this patch. So, you know, it's perception is a lot and you know i think one of the key things is the game needs more trend setters because right now i mean you know there's there's a few people out there that people look to but i think you know we really need some more key deck builders to try and uh, popularize certain things because as you know from your own impact and there's a few other people out there like raiku and life coach and various others that people uh, you know copy from but I hope, you know, as the game goes forward, we'll see more people that uh, people are looking to to kind of grab ideas from. I agree. Dale, how would you feel about the patch? <laughs> I'm loving the patch. Uh, I don't know, like, maybe I just haven't uh, seen enough of this meta. I feel like I have, but I don't know, like, it, it feels like there's a good breath of fresh air that was brought in, at least, at least from my perspective, because I'm just like, okay, like, what cards got added and for the most part there's a lot of neutrals there's a lot of uh you know stuff that doesn't really like scream like oh hey like new archetype try this thing like this is gonna be cool and shake everything up but it just feels like a good overall mix of extra cards that are extra tools that any deck can try and look at now and be like maybe i want to run a couple of this and i don't like i feel like there's a lot of experimentation to be had with this patch that uh I think right now we're just in the habit of, okay, it was working well. Is it still working? Sure, we'll keep up with that. But I would expect that to change in the coming weeks. Sounds good. I think we can, we'll can. we go more in depth with the patch uh, later on as we talk about the Halloween event and the new cards and all that kind of things. But this was just kind of a general first impressions. And uh, Reth, as you mentioned, Unseen Elder, uh, which kind of nicely segues into talking about golds becoming targetable because Unseen Elder, I think part of maybe why he fell off in play was Gold's becoming target or made him a very good Scorch target, a very good Igni target. And that's potentially one of the reasons why he was less popular, though you have said he's getting more popular. Do yourself, CD Projekt Red, how do you guys feel like the gold change has impacted the game? Do you think it's been mostly positive or do you feel like it's something where, as Swim hinted, you know, we've got bigger things coming further on that maybe 
the gold change had to do with and maybe you know we'll get the full picture later um generally we're really happy with how the gold changes turned out i mean the if you go back several you know patches ago the general thing was that you'd end up with you know players playing two golds in the last round or something along those lines and it would kind of come down to who kept their golds in their hand if you go even further back there's there was uh, particular methods where Squirtel was deliberately getting like five gold cards and you know and they would thin their decks so efficiently that you just ended up with every uh, third round or second round if they were two zeroing you was kind of against three square two or three Squirtel bron- uh, gold cards and often you wouldn't win because gold cards are more powerful than the bronze or silver cards in general that you'd have in your hand. Um, and I think that situation just doesn't really exist anymore. And part of that is to do with gold dam- uh, golds being damageable. And part of it as well is to do with the inflation of, uh, well, let's just say closing the gap between bronze, silver, and gold. I mean, that's a deliberate choice on our part. And we often see people commenting about the fact that uh, bronze cards are power creeping. I mean, that's deliberate. It first of all, it makes the game less pay to win, which is one thing because bronze is are cheaper and therefore uh, if they're more comparable to the uh, power level of silvers and golds then you're not necessarily reliant on having those cards to basically win the game um so there's a lot of different factors kind of that, that work there to you know uh from our perspective that seem uh to really show a good trend and from what we see in statistics and such of how the game's doing players seem to agree i think that's fair to say i think the gold changes generally worked and you make a good point about uh making it feel less pay to win because obviously the new player experience is very important and i remember when i first started playing Gwent, it was very frustrating because that was back at the point where you didn't even start with four golds you started with Geralt (laughs) uh, so you just had Geralt and then you'd queue up and because it was close beta there also maybe weren't as many new players to queue against so it would be quite disheartening and i think that the new player experience has definitely gotten better and it does seem to be something that cdpr are I think like they're very aware of, which is good. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, go ahead, Tim. Oh, I was just gonna say, speaking of which, a lot of people are really kind of comparing Gwen's current state to you know the current state of other games, most notably Hearthstone. Uh, <gasps> but kind of <laughs> said it. Kind of forgetting that. I mean, Gwen's in a beta, and people kind of use that as a meme or an excuse. But like Hearthstone in its beta form had a lot of problems, and it took a lot of time for it to you know resolve all of those problems. I think people are, I find it strange, and I think a lot of people at the company do when people say that uh, this beta has been a long time. Some of the like most popular games out there were in beta for over two years, some three. I mean, the Dota 2 beta was incredibly long. League of Legends, for those of you people that were uh, playing it when it was in beta, was incredibly long. Uh, you, know, you have a bunch of other games out there that are you know, huge hits on early access, like uh, Rust and such, and these you know these games have been in an early access or let's say beta state whatever you want to call it for a considerable amount of time i mean we're coming up on a year now and you know i i'm pretty categorically sure we're not going to hit a two-year point where the game is still in beta so uh it's you know it's i said not going to just (laughs) Um, but you know, so it's quite odd for people to say that, you know, this is super long for a beta. I think that many people are used to kind of marketing betas, which is like, oh, this game is in beta for two weeks to avoid a launch problem and pretend that it's okay and cover it up. And that's not really what we've been doing with this game. I mean, um, for anybody that played the game in closed beta or even earlier played the E3 and Gamescom demos from last year, the game has changed a huge amount and evolved. And I've talked about before how I think the key to this game is kind of evolution. And, you know, a lot of people who complain about cards being changed over the various months and so on and so forth. But, I mean, I think many people wouldn't be interested in the game if we hadn't made those changes to keep the game interesting and, you know, keep it active. So... I think evolution and uh, is kind of a big key to, to you know making Gwent an interesting game, and uh, you know sometimes those evolutions work out really well, and we're really happy with them. I mean, look at you can look at weather as an example of that. In the past, I I think if people were playing, a lot of players were seeing how weather used to be. I mean, play Ragnarok, set all of your opponents' units to one. It's quite powerful. <laughs> <laughs> just a bit, just a bit. So, you know, it's things have really changed a lot, and I think mostly for the positive. I mean, we're not perfect. We, we're all human. Our developers try really hard, but we do make mistakes, and, you know, we're not afraid to uh, rectify them if we do, often, which is why we've, you know, changed some cards that we felt were too good or too bad or whatever the case may be. 
That's fair to say. I think we also see that on the esports side of things with uh, player input being taken for things like invite spots and, and that sort of thing. I think CDPR in general are quite a responsive company in terms of their engagement with their community. Um, but speaking of, you're speaking about the beta and how we've had one year of beta. What would you say for Gwent is the biggest kind of achievement in the last year or accomplishment? And what is something that you're looking forward to showcasing? You don't have to give us all the details, but like <laughs> releasing to to the the uh, you, you I guess community. What we, so the thing that the thing that you, you're most looking forward to our reaction. So should we say? Um, I think the thing I'm uh, you know most pleased with or most proud of is just the the how far the game has come and i think that a lot of people underestimate that because they they kind of come into the, if someone comes into the game two or three months ago game is very different if you look back at october of last year is really drastically different and people talk about there not being enough cards in gwent there was a lot less than there is right now obviously there's going to be a lot more i mean uh, we talked about you know we've given out some numbers of how many cards we intend there to be in the past at certain different points throughout the evolution of the game and you know we have a lot of cards that are in the works and are going to be released over the you know let's just you know, the very the next months next year so on and so forth you know we as a company we have plans to support the game for a very long time and there's a lot of uh, very cool stuff coming and speaking of kind of the thing i'm most excited for i think um i'm not sure i would either say like our second game mode or maybe the single player they're, they're very different in their function second game mode is we've talked about it before and it's kind of weird that um we've publicized it several times i mean it was even in our gamescom uh, press demo and so on and so forth so uh, you know i think something in general the community would do which would be great is anytime anyone asks about a second game mode it's like every time it's posted on reddit or something like that it's like this is a brand new idea that someone's just had that they should add a second game mode and uh, <laughs> we've, we've been talking about it for a long time i mean um we actually talked about it with the group of people that came to visit Nilf, uh, the last year actually so that's really you know something we've been putting a lot of effort into and working on for a while and uh, when it's ready it'll be released and we hope players will enjoy it i mean We've said before that it's you know it's a bit different and uh, you know we've got some a twist of our own to this idea which Ooh. we think will make it very interesting and I can't talk more about that yet but when you are ready we will um, <laughs> unfortunately I'm, I'm not pa I'm not Pavel I can't give you lots of leaks so <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a shame we'll, we'll um, have to have him on next week then <laughs> and, and for the for the single player we the single player is really huge it's going to be fantastic i'm super proud of the work that everybody's done on that and uh you know there's some little snippets of information out there about that and again when we're ready to show more we will and you know people often wonder why we don't show more and you know we're trying to start to show more we've been showing some card arts and you know rolling out some information and you know, I think um, the community and PR team definitely have some interesting things that they'll be talking about over the coming weeks. And, uh, you know, we've got some cool eSport events and those will definitely have some information about the game as well. Yeah, we do have, uh, was it Gwent Open this month and then Gwent Masters? Uh, Gwent the Challenger. The Challenger, yeah, the yeah, Challenger for Challenger. December. So it's going to be a good end of the year, shall we say, for Gwent eSports. But talking about single player i guess this leads nicely on to salvine the was it day of the dead day of the dead holiday of the dead holiday yeah yeah so i guess we can talk about this generally not just uh to retha so you know swim and daily allowed to have an opinion now uh i've got i i'm known for my opinions um No, you know, uh, re regarding the the Salvin event, I actually think it was pretty great. Like just in terms of comparing it to the Mahaka Mail event, it seemed like a pretty major step up. Like I've been on the record saying it's you know more flavorful, more distinct. It took longer because of course it was you know a little bit harder, and I, I view that as a positive for sure. Because you know it, it, the the Ale event, it feels like it was you know a little more of a breeze through, and yeah, people people are really enjoying it. Yeah, for sure. I agree with you. The Hakamail event was just such a nice teaser on like what a single player and experience can be like, what uh, these events can look like. And then like everyone got used to that. And it's like, cool, like we want more of this. And then CDPR delivers with more of this. Like the Holiday of the Dead event was awesome. Uh, it was decently challenging, too. I'm sitting there for a couple hours, I think, where I'm just like, all right, I think I figured this puzzle out this time, but I'm just going to go ahead and run through it and see if it works. <laughs> like it was, it was good. It was fun. I, I really enjoyed the puzzles this time. I like the uh, lore perspective from it as well, where we got like a little bit of a cool story with all of it. Uh, it was definitely one of my favorite events. 
And you know, you know what, like the icing on top of all of that is that they've kind of, they've shown us the pattern with, you know, the Mahakam Ale event that they'll show these new effects in the game, the new arts, and then they're going to print them on stuff. So now that we kind of know that, not necessarily for sure, but it's an established pattern, we can kind of speculate about what we've seen from this event, the arts, and even the particle effects like, you know, Vesemir's Igni and the like gas bomb he throws or whatever. We can kind of speculate on how those will show up in the multiplayer game. Go Go ahead. No, no, go go ahead, please. (laughs) I was going to say that's true, and also it gives us a little bit of a flavor for potentially Thronebreaker because this is also single player content. Um, and I think it's been really cool to see CDPR change the game because obviously in the first round and the second round, uh, sorry, the first uh, game mode and the second game mode, you're not trying to win two out of three rounds. You're just trying to win one round with an objective, which is very, very different from what we're used to. Uh, and I think it's really refreshing um, and it gives a good kind of a flavor of, of the different things that CDPR are maybe thinking about for the single player campaign, which then I think probably makes the community more excited. Like I'm more hype about Thronebreaker because of Salvine than I was beforehand. Uh, it's the whole day events are really scratching the surface of what the single player is. I mean, um, we showed some things at Gamescom, and you kind of have a whole RPG system in the background where you, like you you play as Queen Maeve, and basically you collect items with her that you kind of build into part of your deck. You have obviously troops that make up your deck as well. Um, so it's really, I think it, I think people will genuinely be quite surprised at, uh, at how kind of big it is, and. Um, you know, it'd definitely be interesting. There's a lot of, uh, you know, if we talk about the way the hold events work, you know, each battle kind of has a gimmick is the idea. And that's kind of what the majority of the single player is. There's obviously some kind of random battles. Uh, sorry, random's not the correct word there. They're not like random encounters like in a Final Fantasy map where they happen <laughs> passively when you walk. It's more, you know, there are things that you can choose to, to battle or not. Um, and those sometimes are kind of... Uh, you know, you're playing again. You might be playing against Nilfgaard, and basically, it's versus the AI rather than it being a specific puzzle. But then the next battle might be, say, you know, a puzzle where you have to defeat a Manticore through doing certain actions within the game and such. And and what's uh what's what's this down here? The, the, the thing, right? That thing. Is there a? Uh... <laughs> oh, so yeah, this this card here. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, this is um, <laughs> it's a cur- it's a cursed weapon, and this is a new category which uh, is item. So we we're, we're constantly adding new categories to the game. It, they give us a lot of flexibility in terms of tutors, in terms of uh, category interaction and stuff. And item is a definitely uh, a category that will do some things. And you know, let's just throw this question out there. Maybe we can uh, get chat to respond to this. Like, which faction would you say this is is for? Northern realms? Items. Ooh. Yeah, I mean apparently chat the, is not responding to that, so you're, they're just writing uh, they're writing I- items. <laughs> the, the, the items the items, the items, are, items faction, I course. expect for many of the current tactics cards to kind of turn into items, like for example, Commander's Horn and maybe Royal Decree. Decoy. A decoy an item? Maybe decoy, yeah. I mean it, it it feels like most of the tactic maybe like half the tactic card would make more sense as items. And so this this category this card here is a Northern Realms card. A hey, nice. nice. Mm-hmm. That's cool because that was also the faction that people have said lacks its own identity. So by adding items to that faction, you then get like Northern Realms item decks in the same way that we have, you know, resurrection decks or hand buff decks for like other factions. Like we could then have the Hensalt items decks or something like that. <laughs> well, I think that uh, you know the. The general point about faction identity is often something that's very weird because, for example, you know, many people complain that Hattori uh, goes against Skellige's faction identity, which is kind of weird because our developers, you know, define what the faction identity is. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's very odd when that stuff happens. And like to look at Northern Realms, there are people that say it doesn't have an identity. But I can tell you that like across the history of the game generally, Northern Realms actually has the healthiest distribution of decks and leader distribution. So, you know, some people might say that it lacks identity, but the player reception to it is that it like works in many ways the best under the hood. Um, you know, if you look at Skellige as an example, obviously there's some very clear identities, but 
People basically play Brown or Crack, and they play them in very specific ways, whereas Northern Realms really can be played in many, many different ways. So having strong identity and theme can both be a blessing and a curse. Absolutely. I think that's <laughs> that's definitely fair to say. And uh, it's cool to see, you know, a leak. It seems to be whenever we, we get CDPR on the show, we get leaks. And it just does to show chat that not, not only... Uh, not only Burza brings the leaks, we also have some Rathas leaks as well. So, no, no, this is, this, is, this is a Burza leak. <laughs> but he's oh, not here. This is a Burza leak? Burza's this leaking Burza from leak. the chat? It's true. Burza, Burza I think, just leaks from <laughs> everywhere. Like, just all around. <laughs> <laughs> like, catch him he's as just, he's writing uh, home and it's like, hold on. I think chat would have been more excited if it was a leak actually sticking out of the pile <laughs> of bones rather than a sword. So, yeah, we should have photoshopped it and just been like a teaser rather than a full-blown leak just put a, a leak over the sword we, we missed a trick there but uh i guess we should go back to we should go back to selvine and uh maybe talk a little bit about the cards that we saw there like the really cool new vampire art and we've seen from this patch that cdpr are happy to recycle up art from events which makes sense you're not going to spend a bunch of time drawing cool cards and then just like throw them away after two weeks that seems a bit silly uh so can we expect to maybe see some cool new vampire cards in the future uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, it's pretty much what I've said uh, in the past many times. You know, if you've seen an artwork, then they'll definitely be in the game at some time. And, like, people may remember, like, even at the E3 build back a long time ago, there was some uh, sirens in the game, and they're still not in the game. They will be at one point. Yeah, even so, even Avalak the Sage Art, that was from way back then as well, and it just now got added. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have very we have specific reasons for making those choices. It's very complicated, and like honestly, stuff I just don't particularly want to get into here. It would take too long, and, and honestly, you know, just isn't really something for this discussion. But you know, we have good reasons for kind of holding off on some things, and you know, we learned a lot of lessons about cards and how many and what we should release, and so on and so forth. And you know, for example, there used to be a lot more token cards in the game, and they just didn't make sense. It's kind of just you know. Um, it wasn't really worth it for us to make lots of, you know, very, uh, the tokens that we release now are not the same kind of quality as the main cards because it just doesn't really make that much sense to do that. And it stops us from producing uh, more cards. And obviously one of the key things that we've, you know, as a team been trying to make sure we can do is have like a good velocity of cards that we actually make. So it's, uh, you know, we've really upped the velocity of cards that we can make since we kind of started the project, just because, you know, there were lessons that we needed to learn as a team and uh, as a company as well. So, uh, like I said before, you know, players can definitely expect there to be a lot more cards coming in the future. That's hmm. fantastic to hear. Yep. Well, speaking of the new cards, I think it's a pretty good segue if we wanted to uh, talk about some of these uh, newer cards that got introduced with this latest patch. And uh, Swim, you already brought up Avalok the Sage. I am really want to know you guys' opinions on Avalok the Sage in particular, because he seems interestingly random. <laughs> it's a fun card. I mean, I've, I've gone on the record saying before that cards that generate unique scenarios, RNG cards, specifically ones that can be used in interesting ways, like, for example, Johnny. Uh, there weren't actually really a lot of them in the game before. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, have this mentality of hating RNG. Like, most of the players who play Gwent seem to be ones that have come from Hearthstone and don't like RNG. Um, but in reality, I think it's important to note the difference between you know, fun RNG and way too competitive for no reason RNG. And I think like cards like Johnny and Avalok the Sage allow you to play these fun decks and they're just healthy for the game. I think a lot of people, you know, I can already see some responses in chat that like this card is terrible, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be. It, the point is, if we made this card like a nine and it did what it did, you'd all be complaining. Yeah. That yeah. Good, which, is yeah. Why it's, which is why it's not a nine and does that. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> It's there to allow people to, you know, have fun if you do it and you pull out like a second T-ball or whatever the case is. I mean, like there's, I see McBeard's in the chat here. I remember some deck where McBeard was like multiplying T-balls or something a long time ago. Um, I think he had three. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, think situations like that, they are fun for people. And then, and the thing is that for those of you that are looking to do hyper competitive decks, this card just isn't for you. And that's Okay. There's cards for everybody, different cards for different types of players and different different game modes as well. I think that's for sure. I was going to mention the new game mode because last time uh, 
on the dev talk they mentioned you know playing a lot of gold cards in the new game mode and, and mentioned that avalak was really good for that so i think it's a card that's kind of an interesting one to to play in kind of crazy game modes where you don't really know what your opponent's playing anyway and also it's just a bit of a fun card because it's similar to gaunter in that regard you know it's a little bit of a risk a little bit of a fun card um but when it pays out you're gonna have a lot of fun and i actually have premium i like the stage i opened him in a keg and then was like well i gotta make this premium because you know what else am i gonna do with my with my uh my dust so i feel like now i have to play him i'm gonna find a deck that totally kicks ass with ever like the sage as like a bamboozle factor you know like maybe play a deck where you would expect woodland spirit and then nope it's ever like the sage <laughs> <laughs> and then it pulls woodland spirit from your opponent so it's all good <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think um out of all the new cards since you know we're talking about them i think the one that has the most interesting implications to me is actually uh, one of the ones that people aren't really talking about that much which is ale of the ancestors specifically because it adds this new category which is boons people have talked about for ages what like positive weathers could look like um and how stuff like that could be in the game and it's really interesting design space to press at the same time you guys have gone and make uh you, you guys have gone and made weathers hazards instead um which you know it, it really opens up a lot of space for you because now you can have you know uh, some interesting non-weather hazards i suppose as well yeah i mean in the in the throne breaker trailer for example there's fire on one of the rows i was gonna yeah i was i was about to mention that yep yeah, and you know, uh, it being called a hazard just gives us more breadth in terms of what we can do with it. Because, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't make that much sense. I mean, even uh, for example, Ragnarok is kind of classified as a spell in uh, in some way as well, because it, it just causes some issues in terms of like the way that we categorize the cards, and also in terms of terminology. Um, so, you know, therefore, just making these kind of new categories, and also like, you know, if you have weather and then you have positive and negative version, like if imagine that we use the word weather instead, like what's mm -hmm. the what's the opposite of weather? There isn't an opposite of weather. It doesn't really work in terms of terminology, in terms of you know there being say boon and hazard is positive negative. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, the fact that we've created this boon category and uh, Ethelin has that category attached to her means there will be obviously more of them coming. Yeah, no, exactly. I, and I got to say, like, this is kind of another step you guys are making kind of away from the Witcher 3 flavor, which is, you know, the, what the identity of weathers and like, you know, how they work. But honestly, it is kind of a necessity from my perspective. A lot of people have made those criticisms in the past that it's lost a lot of lore and flavor. But the Witcher 3 Gwent was just so singularly designed to be a minigame that I, I just feel like it's so necessary that moving away from it in a lot of ways has to be done for the multiplayer to just really work. Uh oh, we lost. Uh -oh. We lost Jagras. I gotta. I think I'm uh -oh. I'm Jagras now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, would, would, would you say you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like things. You know, there are some. There are often claims about some certain things should be like they are in The Witcher Three and so on, and. Um, they're just they're, they're very different games. I mean, obviously they share similarities and they share the same core ideas, but the, it just went, wouldn't work in The Witcher Three as a multiplayer game that you would play for any kind of extended period of time. Um, you know, we we tested it extensively internally before uh, you know launching the beta last year, and the game became very boring very quickly when <laughs> yeah. you, you were playing with like you know just a card that's six strength and does nothing else. And, you know, it didn't really work in that way. And I think, you know, if we're looking to support this game for the long time, which we definitely are as a company, like I said before, it has to evolve. It has to grow. New mechanics need to be added. New ways to play the game need to be added. Um, and, you yeah, know, that's kind of just, I think, the natural progression of, of how this, uh, you know, this game has to go. That's fair to say. So get out of my box. This, this is a what? swim free zone. I'm... I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I'm disconnected doesn't mean I don't know what's going on in here. Uh, you know what? You know the rules. You, people have to fill in. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk a little bit, I guess, about this boot in, in particular? This one I thought was really cool, but it confused me a little bit. Because what I love the ancestors, the card says, like, while on a row, bathe the row in golden froth. But at the same time, that can be countered because you can then play frost or fog or <laughs> rain on top of that. And then it gets rid of the froth, even though the ale of the ancestors is still on the row which mm -hmm. I found like a little bit confusing because it says, well, on a row, bathe it in froth. So I assumed that it would just counteract the effects of weather, but it doesn't do that. And I'm sad. No, I, 
I mean, if it did, it would in some ways maybe be too good. But I mean, generally, the the reason it's like that is because it follows the keg around. So if you move the keg or your opponent moves the keg, then the weather is well, I call it a weather in this case, it's boon. Uh, the boon is reapplied to that row. So it, yeah. it allows you to do some, you know, potentially interesting things with it, or your opponent can disrupt you by moving it instead of destroying it as well. And that's another really interesting thing that the that the keg kind of implies about future design space that you guys are going to have the ability or potentially you know maybe even want to put these hazards and boons on units, which kind of makes them it gives you like two different ways of countering them, right? Uh, so some people have actually suggested that like something like Ragnar could have a body. That's that's maybe a weird example, uh, but it just gives you multiple ways of countering it. That's really cool. Yeah, I think definitely more of that stuff in the future for sure. I mean, it, giving special cards a body, you know, it makes them no longer a special card. And, you know, I've talked before, I think the last time or maybe the time before I was on the show about um, special cards and generally wanting them to be tutored because they lack uh, uh, viability in some cases. And making them tutored makes some of them that wouldn't be viable otherwise viable. You were actually talking about that just before we started the stream, Swim, uh, about like the amount of bronze spell cards and such. And, you know, it's it's definitely something we're aware of. And, uh, you know, this is kind of a way that helps us address that a little yeah. bit. Well, you, you guys are moving towards, like, this tag synergy. And it's obviously, it feels to me like it's taking time to develop. And once the tag synergy is all there, then a lot of these bronze cards are going to be, I mean, they're, the, the, the design space of decks is going to be flush, right? You're going to have a lot of new tools to work with. But until it, until it feels comfortable with decks having those, like, you know, like Alchemy Nilfgaard and Organic Skellige and whatever, it is going to be a little bit awkward, but that's fine. I mean, Alchemy got a lot of additions in this patch, and, you know, mm -hmm. as we go through and add a lot more cards to the game, obviously each of those categories is going to get filled out more. I mean, yeah. you know, right now, if you have a card that tutors bronze spells, there are not many options for that right now. Uh, but, you know, say a year from now, there's going to be considerably more. Makes sense. And obviously with those new uh, additions, then you also see other cards getting buffed it's, it's similar to the whole cursed thing we saw this patch with uh, mm -hmm. there was already the oh, what's the card called that draws a cursed his Skull. name is Skull. yeah Skull. so then he inadvertently got buffed because we then got more cursed synergies which i guess we can then lead us on to talk a little bit about some of the new cards because that is what we're we're talking <laughs> about i feel like we should maybe finish the neutral ones first but like i want to talk about cursed because I, I like cursed. Oh, cursed just, do, so you, do, you do you go in whatever order you please Okay, so we saw our good friend with his skulls. What are they called? Wilmar, Wilhelm, and... Wilfred. Wilfred, Wilfred. Yeah. I can't remember what his name is. Good old is. Harold Houndsnout. Harold Houndsnout. Harold I haven't met him in The Witch yet. I'm about to go to... I haven't gone to Skellige yet. I'm, yeah, I'm neither, like, neither have I. <laughs> I don't think you've gone out of White Orchard yet, to be fair, Swim, so... No, 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 I made it out of White Orchard. I fought no, outside yeah. of White Orchard. I, I ran he around over that a little bit. The yeah. griffin is literally just outside of White Orchard, like in a field. <laughs> I think it was an arch griffin, actually. Mm. I remember it was clearing my weather. <laughs> That's true. Uh, nice. So we've, we've, like I said, we've seen uh, these new cursed units, such as Harold Houndsnow, and uh, a really I interesting card good. in that he has three different his three yeah. different skulls, and they all do different things, and you kind of have different options for how you interact with him. Is that something think... that we'll see more of, Dale? Go. No, I was just going to say, I think one of the coolest things about Harold Houndsnout is that it introduced this new category on one of the skulls. I think it's uh, one of revenge. the uh, wills. But the revenge Will Wilmar. Tag. Wilmar. Yeah, sure. uh, yep. uh, and I, I think that's something that's a neat new tag. So as far as I'm aware, we haven't seen that before. Because Death Wish just triggers every time the unit dies. But Revenge specifically requires you to be the one uh, triggering it. So it leads to some interesting counterplay, I think, uh, Especially on Harold Hounds, not saying sounds the only guy would hit right now, but uh, like if you're playing as the against somebody who uses Harold Hounds not against you, and you're like, all right, cool. Like this has the revenge tag, I can safely pop this on my turn, and he won't get the benefit of it. So I, I really like that tag as an idea of trying to balance out some of these more powerful tempo plays uh, that your opponent is trying to set up. So I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more of that. But as far as Harold Hounds is concerned, he's just a freaking awesome guy hanging out with some skulls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that card. It's super flavorful, it's super interesting, helps push like a kind of underdeveloped archetype. That might actually be maybe my favorite card all around of the set. 
Yeah, I think we're, we're generally really happy with Harold, and I think that Cursed as an archetype uh, hasn't seen a lot of love. It actually has been very playable, and we actually had some players in the top 100 that uh, have played Cursed at various points, and they actually were making it work. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's a Cursed deck going around at the moment, and uh, I'm happy to see that. And it's, you know, if you get your Berserker Marauders rolling, they can really get some high values, especially when yeah. you combine it with Warcrys. I think it was one of the most fun things for me prior to the patch uh, after watching the dev stream. And I'm just like, all right, cool. Like, we're getting some curse synergy. What is the curse deck looking like? And I just built it prior to the patch. I'm like, this isn't bad. Where did this deck come from? It's just been sitting here and there's been so many other Skellige variants running around. Yeah, I think kind of like I said before, I mean, people get very focused on certain things. And that's kind of what's defined as, as being playable. And, you know, obviously there are plenty of people out there. I mean, you know, unfortunately for some players, they encounter the same thing over and over. And and I think players expect us to do something about that. And to be honest, there's not really a lot we can do about that. It's kind of the nature of card games is when you're at the highest levels. I can tell you that that situation generally doesn't exist throughout the rest of the game. It's really, you know, it's very predominant at the high end of the game that people play similar decks and across the rest of the game. There's really a huge amount of variety. It's just, you know, when you're at that top level, people min-max, and it's just kind of how it goes. I mean, Sometimes these things just happen. Well, you know, it's uh, we can keep changing things, and then that will change. But, you know, there's there's a subset of players that just migrate to, you know, what is considered the best by, you know, certain people. And we actually, like, have numbers on how on the kind of percentage of the player base that is. And it's, like, about 50... There's about 15% of our players at the top end that just shift, basically, to a, set, to a faction that is considered the best. And as soon as it's considered the best, next day, it's just, like, 15% higher. <laughs> on the and it's... <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it coincides with your decks, Swim. Uh, as you know, anyway. So, just how it goes. My decks? Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes it's Raikou's. Sometimes it's <laughs> too. So just depends, it's, I guess. It's definitely like a flavor of the... Of, and sometimes it's flavor of the day. I feel like uh, up at the top end of the ladder, one day you'll be playing and it'll all be like Skellige. And the next day, suddenly Skellige's out and it's all monsters. And it's it's kind of strange the way that that happens sometimes. It's just like a, a, a flick of the switch almost. And you see a big change. But I think it's definitely f- uh, fair to say that it's a problem at high rank. Because I love... The, the ranked ladder from about you know when it gets reset up to 4k because you can more or less do what the heck you like you can play whatever you like and usually it works out pretty much you know okay so long as you can win like at least half of your games so as long as you're not i think rushing to climb the ladder uh you can have a lot of fun in ranked um and so for me that's my favorite part of the of the ranked season is right after the reset mm-hmm. when i'm suddenly like be, like kind of free to more or less play whatever i like whereas once you hit about four, two hundred or so. Then you, you maybe have to try out a little bit. Yeah, I think that um, you know, I, I think that will only get better. To be honest, with the change in seasons being a month long as well, because that kind of like fresh period will be there for you know more common for more players. And you know, the way our rank system is built, uh, generally it's very generous for people, uh, you know, so that they find it enjoyable. Um, we might need to tweak some things at the top end in terms of numbers a little bit if the seasons change to a month. Obviously, rewards need to be adapted. Uh, it's pretty simple there. You, half the season length half the rewards um so we'll see how that goes but i think that you know that kind of excited excitement feeling and the variety generally should feel better for a lot of people because uh of the seasons having a kind of quicker turnaround Mm. does that mean we get like twice the end of season rewards in terms of portraits and borders and that side of things uh, yeah, I mean, I've mentioned it before that the rewards will, I mean, we're not 100% set on this. We'll see how it goes. I mean, only time will tell. But the general idea is that we want to make like 12 sets of rewards and they would cycle each year. Um, so, you know, if it's January 2017 or January 2018, uh, you would have the same borders as rewards. Obviously, 2017 would be going back in time, but uh, you know what I mean. The, the point yeah. is that every January, every February season, every March season, the rewards would basically be kind of uh, you know f- set for that month, and they'll have a theme in to some degree, which kind of ties with the month a little bit. Obviously, you could expect like, for example, like now we have the Wild Hunt rewards for the this upcoming season. Obviously, you know Wild Hunt very uh, you know synergistic with Frost. It makes a lot of sense for them to be a winter reward. Um, you know, uh, so we kind of try to theme the rewards in in some kind of way like that. 
Yeah. Now, what so it means it's lots, lots more borders, lots more avatars, <laughs> and lots more titles, basically. So, Jagras. I was just going to say, so from that, it means that they're kind of exclusive to a degree, but they're not <clears throat> ever at a point where they're unobtainable to newer players. Because I know there are people who come in and want to collect everything, and that would just encourage them to compete more on uh, in future years. The only thing I, I, would, I would say about Wild Hunt is I'm totally offended that the rank one gets Wild Hunt King, but there is no Wild Hunt Queen. Shocking. There's also Man at Arms, but where in is Woman at Arms? 2017, Rethaz. I know. What is How this? does this happen? <laughs> Shaking my head. <laughs> um, I think, un- unfortunately, in this case, it's just being true to the law because obviously er- Eridan is the Wild Hunt uh. King, and, you know, that's just kind of how it goes. With <laughs> <laughs> But to be fair, I think <laughs> I do wonder if one of the what was the dryad reward, the top one. Hmm, I can't remember. I thought it was Queen of Broccolon at one point, or maybe that's something in the future. I'm not sure. We'll oh, oh leaks. potential leaks. Spoiler. Yeah, <laughs> if we had a dryad one, it's fine. I mean, here on Gwental Men, we don't we don't discriminate. You know. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so continuing on with those new cards uh one i like a lot is uh the hey may battle maiden keeping it with skellig still uh one of the things that it, i think skellig has always struggled with uh has been th- like consistency uh there's always been the discard skellig that's able to just tear through its own deck but you try and do any other form of the skellig and you're just like all right cool round three i've got like 10 cards left i'd like to see those uh is that something that you know, was actively a consideration with this card, Rethaz, for uh, trying to enable some consistency in other Skellige types? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I made a post a while back uh, in reply to some, I think, I can't remember the exact thread, but there was a thread about uh, some con- uh, access. It was about access for certain factions, and uh, basically we talked about monsters and um, Skellige in that thread. And Basically, we were already working on these cards, which was Slyzard and uh, the Battle Maiden. Generally, they're they're in the game to facilitate the ability to get extra copies out of your deck from those factions without re- without really making them too powerful. Um, you know, if they were just simply a copy of the Reaver Scout, it would be probably a bit boring. And second of all, they would just be too good. Um, if they were like that, and I think if you just purely put a uh, you know a Reaver Scout in Skelliger, it would not be what we want. I mean, the minus one damage doesn't sound like it's a lot, but it does make a difference. I mean, you know, all the points add up, and uh, you know, being wounded also can be a negative in some ways. It's obviously a positive in Skelliger, which is kind of on purpose as well, obviously. But you know, there there are drawbacks to it, and the same with Slyzard. I mean. Uh, Slyzard has its own kind of drawbacks, and but it also again has its own benefits. So they're you know they're definitely to to enable certain things more in those decks, and we definitely you know we can already see uh, certain cards that weren't being played are being played because of those enablers now. And you know that's again something to definitely see for the future. I mean, while the Wild Hunt decks took a massive step up when we added Wild Hunt Navigators to the game, for example. Yeah, I, th- I think they're great. I, I think those two cards are uh, among my favorites of the set in terms of just their impact on deck building space. That's and from a gameplay oh perspective, <laughs> we'll figure this out. All right. From a gameplay perspective, one thing that does uh, trip me up sometimes with the Battle Maiden is that it does seem to have some oddness on not applying the damage if there's not another unit in the deck. Is that something that uh, CDPR is aware of and is intending? To, is that intended? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'll make a note of it. I hadn't actually heard about that before, and I even looked through the me- the mega bug thread today, and I didn't see it. Well, it's it's uh, not really a bug. It's because of how how they're coded. They're coded to target like Reaver Scouts, so that if there's nothing left in your deck, it won't let you target the unit, right? Yep. Th- is that something uh, yeah. that Source Three will fix? Oh yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, basically, like we actually had this card working in a different way, uh, and it's actually on. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate like we had basically it worked with everything but it didn't work with the um 
berserker skirmishers because what it would do is it would damage them and then it would trigger the ability to pull the card out so you would damage the berserker skirmisher it would turn into a bear and then because you have no bears in your deck it wouldn't <laughs> work so unfortunately due to the tech limitations it literally wouldn't work with one of the main cards it was designed to work with um, so that should actually be working better in the tech update Ah, now Absolutely. is there that this this tech update from from you guys like mentioning it, it? It does seem to be something that will kind of uh, allow for you know some some healthy changes like that. Is there um is it is is it is it a big deal or is it like a small deal? It, it depends what you, it depends what you mean. But like a lot of the bugs that players encounter that are frustrating and like. You know, the game is actually very large, and I think a lot of people underestimate how complex Gwent is. It's actually exceptionally complicated, and, you know, we have a team of testers, and they do, you know, absolutely everything they can to try and track down everything. But when you have, you know, the the permutations of, and you know, uh, of different combinations that there are is, you know bordering on levels of insanity it's like there's so many different cards and so many ways they can interact with each other that it's not really you know feasible to to really check everything um they try the absolute best they can and, and sometimes some, some things slip through The t a lot of the technology changes we've been working on are kind of to make the underlying systems are a lot more reliable so we shouldn't really see those kind of inconsistencies that we have in the game sometimes like uh, there was an issue in this patch that was fixed with the Dolbothana Protector, with uh, Farseers and uh, Alzel's Double Cross, and it's actually now, uh, I believe, working the way it should be, but it wasn't working that way before. And, and again, the fact that it was, then it wasn't, it leads to confusion with players. And a lot of the, you know, it's, uh, the work behind this tech upgrade is to kind of try and eliminate uh, a lot of those situations which cause confusion or bugs or problems. So, you know, there's there's obviously some other things coming alongside it, but uh, the main kind of, I mean, you know, for example, we've talked about some improvements like combining the deck builder and the collection and, and some other things as well. Um, but the, I think the biggest gain that most players will see is the stability of mechanics, which obviously is a very important thing. Oh, yeah. I think that would be good, especially with things like um, sequencing of cards and that is something that you kind of have to play around with to know exactly how that's going to going to trigger. But if the tech update helps with some of these bugs and those sorts of things, I think that's going to benefit everyone. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we definitely hope so. It's actually, it you know, the game has grown a huge amount since the, uh, given the E3 demo, if we go back, and the tools that we were making the game on then are, are very different to the tools that we have now for this new system, which they really give us a huge amount more power, and um, they give us the ability to do some really, you know, really new and interesting things with cards. And, you know, when our first kind of, you know, big sets of cards get released in the future, Ooh. we will... I mean, it's obvious that we will be releasing a lot more cards. Well, um, we can we can always hope and that it's obvious, sets. but it's nice listening, like confirming from one of you know. It's nice hearing it. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, we, you know, we've talked about that before. Obviously, you know, I've said if you go back to our like Chinese um, press release a long time ago, we talked about how many cards we wanted in the game. Uh, this calendar year and, and such so you know there's obviously like you know in general across the next year we want to release really a lot more cards we want to up our game in terms of how many we're releasing and you know obviously we can't give any dates on that at this time and, and when we're when we're ready to the pr team will definitely be uh, you know communicating that out and uh, sharing you know cards with people to reveal like kind of we did in the last uh, you know 21 cards getting the community involved in that again is a very important part of it for for us as a company i think yeah, I mean, that's actually something I was going to touch on. The card pool is kind of at the point where these, I mean, before, uh, you know, an addition of 20 cards could actually really shake up the meta, but the card pool itself is kind of at the point where, you know, percentage wise, the addition of 20 cards, it, it, it stops being enough to, you know, just by itself you know, create a lot of new decks and really stir up things without, you know, additional changes. So, you know, these kinds of large expansions, I think, would, would go a very long way in terms of doing that. I mean, you know, long term for the plan, we obviously have uh, long term. Sorry for the project, we have you know plans to do big updates for the game for sure. I swear to say, I think Nilfgaard was one of the best updates in like terms of the ones I experienced. It was one of my favorite ones in terms of how it changed the game, what it brought to the game. It was a really, it was a lot of new cards, which was fantastic, but also just the way it, it kind of shook everything up. I remember that patch specifically being one of my favorites. 
Uh, but I guess we should go back to this patch a little bit and touch on some oh, more we, of these. We, we could talk a little bit about that. I mean, Pavel did did uh, leak before that we actually would have, you know, new factions in the game. So, uh, it's, it, yeah, that, I, that, that, we, that, we still have to react like that, right? That's, <laughs> that's a, that's a, Burza, a Burza leak. But um, <laughs> okay, so that's definitely something that we still have, you know, uh, targets set for and uh, there's definitely some you know there'll be some interesting developments there not not yet but uh you know they, there's some really cool things happening there for the future Ooh. well we made predictions about when the next faction was going to come out on previous patch swim's very, very hopeful <laughs> like his was his was, was early 2018 um, i was summer always, 2018 always the optimist i, yeah, I, th- I give, think i think i think i guess i think i guessed march did I guess March? Did I? Did I? I think, I think you were. Right. Yeah, I think you were about March, and I said June, and then I can't remember what Dale. What did you? Dale was. I, I, I was like super late, wasn't I? Yeah, probably. Dale's not. Yeah. Dale is not an optimistic fellow. That's what we can take away from this. No, yeah, <laughs> I am actually pretty darn optimistic, but I, I, I know how long it takes with software development things. So I, I work in that field. <laughs> Yeah, things take time, and um, unfortunately, uh, yeah. we always yeah. wish things could be quicker. But you know, just things do take a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, the amount of times we're like in. two days, and we're already right. Like, when's the next patch? <laughs> New factions, <laughs> throne breaker. Like, this is just I think this is just how <laughs> the community kind of is. Anyway, we'll go back to to new cards. I guess I want to talk a little bit about. I want to talk about Ron Vid of Small Marsh because I think that this is a really fantastic card. Uh, in that he, I love how he keeps coming back because I encountered him so many times in The Witcher, and then in the last time I accidentally, this is a this is a spoiler, I killed him by accident because I thought that if I fought him I wouldn't kill him, and then I chopped his head off and was like I can't kill him, like he th- then he won't come back and fight me, so I I <laughs> saved scums back and then just axied him instead. Nice, but uh, th- this is a really interesting card in that you got that. I mean, people complain about carryover, but this is, it's a one strength carryover. But more importantly, the big deal I think about him is he's crewman. So this opens up Northern Realms machines uh, a lot more. Is this, is this something that I guess CDPR are wanting to, to work with, with more options for crewmen and that? Because I think at the moment, a lot of the time you see crewmen, they just get killed or locked. Uh, I don't know. I think it depends. Uh, actually, in general, in Northern Realms, we see uh, machines working very well. Certain machines work better than others. And um, some of that is to do with the meta as well. We've been through different metas where different machines were played a lot more than others as well. Right now, um, we see ballistas doing really good things. Uh, but you know, people have also just called those cards complete trash at various times as well. So it kind of just like... You know, different metas, different cards become good, become bad. So I think machines in general is something in Northern Realms that will it will always be there, and we'll definitely see more support for it. I think something that definitely is missing that will come in the future is you know potentially silver and m- more silver and gold support for the machine archetypes because there's lots of bronze machines, and you know we probably don't need more bronze machines right now, but they definitely need some uh, you know assistance in the silver and gold area. Well, I think machines did get uh, some. Uh, well, you got a new silver machine on uh, Northern Realms, though. But uh, hefty yes. Helga. But it, but it's in effect <laughs> it's in that now. It, but but Nilfgaard has crewmen now. Rethes, that's true. It, should we take the fact that Combat Engineer has crewmen as a hint that Nilfgaard may be experiencing some kind of machine archetype in the future? Uh, you can take it however you wish. Does <laughs> <laughs> Combat Engineer have, so Combat have crewmen? Yeah, yeah, they added it. Oh, That's deliberate, obviously. It's not it's not accidental that it's it is a deliberate choice. And you know, the reason for that will be revealed in the future. Oh, I didn't notice this. This is exciting. Um, oh, oh but then but then you can keep what? your machines on okay. the board as well. Oh, trebuchets. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> But sorry to detract from I, 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 I really can't say more about that particular thing right now. But you know, we'll it, it it'll be you know, at some point. Uh, you know, we'll come back to that that point, and people will be like, ah, that's why. January. <laughs> <laughs> no. So he's just like teasing, teasing as much information as he can out of breath as right now. <laughs> But going back to uh, Ron for the Small Marsh, I actually really like this card because as the one point carryover, I think is is like as low as you can go as far as carryover is concerned. But it's still carryover, which I think is, we could have a pretty lengthy discussion on that. I bet. But uh, 
specifically with Ronvin, like enabling the crewman every uh, round for Northern Realms, presuming that he doesn't get locked, is such a nice benefit to the machine decks. And as I was pointing out, like the, the amount of machines that Northern Realms has, it always feels like there's a machine to answer any situation. It's just like, all right, how do I want to gear up for battle like this time? And Northern Realms will just, especially as we get more machines, we just got catapult this patch. Uh, is just going to have an answer no matter what the meta is. What do you think, Swim? I agree. Uh, in in regard to you know the machines and their archetype, I think uh, the one thing that machines kind of have always felt like they're missing is kind of like Retha said with uh, you know brawn, uh, silvers and gold support. Most notably, I think at this point. Something that kind of scales with how many machines you have, right? Because there's a lot of kind of machine decks, but they're very hybridized, right? They're not really full machine decks. Whereas if there's, you know, some mechanics that scale with everything that you have, then, you know, we will start seeing these full machine decks. I'm, I'm not sure that necessarily you need to have full machine decks as it is. I think that, um, you know, a, definitely a larger portion of it wants to be that, but there's, you know... Definitely some cards that can kind of just go along in support of that as well. Um, but yeah, I think uh, as we've you know said now, there's there's just some support in the gold and silver area uh, that's needed there. And but machines in general uh, really are played a lot. I mean, um, it depends again on the meta. Like battering rams have seen a lot of play. Ballistas have seen a lot of play. Reinforced ballistas in certain metas have seen a lot of play. Reinforced trebuchets have. We actually we actually did an experiment um, with the reinforced trebuchet and crew this patch, and we just weren't confident to launch that because we felt it was probably too good um so we're kind of revisiting that and trying to figure out how to make that work because you know if you the, the kind of problem there is if you end up with uh, three of them on the board and they're doing three damage each turn it's really a lot um so we you know we're kind of still trying to figure out how to to make them work in a way where they don't feel um you know too good because the, the numbers they were putting out were just you know pretty pretty crazy yeah, Burza had also said earlier that you guys were like experimenting with some cool way to make Unseen Elder, you know, uh, you know, in a more interesting or you know less counterable card. So I, I, I kind of have to imagine that's kind of falling on the same line. Something that you know might might happen uh, down the road. Uh, it's more about that's related to our tech stuff. It's something we've wanted to, to do for a long time. Like um, some of the cards, we'd like to have kind of some built-in protection against, uh, yeah. Um, destroy effects uh because you know you lose a lot of value on those and that's kind of the reason that we haven't really looked at changing those as well i mean generally they are high risk reward cards at the moment and for the state of the game that it currently is that's really totally fine as unseen elder in this patch proves and tibor has seen some play in the last patch in certain decks as well um so but the general idea there is to have some kind of uh, protection and um, due to the way that the tech currently works is when a card is destroyed, it's destroyed. And if it comes back, it comes back like Morgvarg, which tr triggers Resurrects, which we don't really want the case. In our tech upgrade, you can kind of destroy a card and it doesn't go to the graveyard. It would just kind of, let's say it would halve its value if it's destroyed, for example. And therefore you keep some of the value that you've kind of risked and you don't get punished in such a harsh manner. It's kind of like Scorch Protection in some way. Um, so that's more of like where the line of thinking there is going. I'm not saying that that'll definitely happen, but uh, you know, it's it's something where we've been looking at for some time, and it just kind of depends on how you know some other factors that relate to it go. Yeah, yeah, and you, you said this would be launching at at around the same time. Uh, well, <laughs> you said this wasn't necessarily happening, but you you were <laughs> saying that this was kind of tied with the yeah. with like the tech change. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I. I imagine that we can maybe expect a good amount of changes when that happens. Uh, I think it's more just in, I wouldn't necessarily call, I mean, there are changes obviously, but I wouldn't call them uh, like changes like people are used to from the game. There's just a lot of things that will work in ways that like, I mean, summoning circle even now has a bunch of weird interactions that shouldn't exist. And we, and you know, that's kind of why we've been working on this, uh, this stuff is to you know make things in a way where those problems are eliminated. So, for example, summoning circle might see some changes. It's not in the core design of the card. It's just in terms of eliminating weird unintended interactions. And uh, and there's a lot of things that relate more to that than say, you know, we're not going to change this card to do something completely different, uh, unrelated to what it was. It's more making some things work in a more concise or better way 
So this is this is confirmation then that the uh, that it cloning uh, artif- uh, the jade figurine isn't isn't necessarily uh, gonna stay. Yeah, that doesn't sound like that's the thing we intended there. It's <laughs> uh, I, I've seen that before, I think, but you know, th- it sounds very easy for people to say, oh, just fix it. But in some cases, oh, there yeah, literally is, it, it is no way to, and that's again why we've been working on this stuff for a long time to to really eliminate a lot of that weirdness. So Play him. go ahead. Oh, I was going to move it on, so you see what you want oh, to do. Oh, okay. I was just going to... Uh, you mentioned that it's not really changes per se, but more of things working as they're uh, more intended to do. Uh, what would be your personal favorite uh, thing working as it's intended to work coming with the tech update? If that question makes sense. No, no that's a good question. I mean, well, without leaking anything, though. Without, yeah. <laughs> well, I said it's because like, it's existing things that are working in unintended ways currently. Like, what would be uh, your personal favorite, Rethas, of like the change that making a card work more, more like it's supposed to that you can't do right now, but can do with the tech update? I have no idea what to answer there because I had no preparation or thought yeah, for that sorry. question. <laughs> it's it's a good, it's a really good question. Um, I, I think actually, I mean, I know it sounds like a cop-out answer, but it's not meant to be. I think actually um, what I mentioned with the Unseen Elder kind of uh, is something I, I really want to see because um, I I was very heavily involved in the design of the Monster Faction and uh, especially Consume. And, you know, um, that's why, you know, I, I some of the critiques about Unseen Elder were valid, but obviously too extreme. Um, and, you know, risking him for super high plays um, you know, you're not going to consume like 50 points with him because that would obviously be too good. So it pushes him into a niche of doing low power consume, which still viable, just limits the options of play for him. Whereas in, you know, if we have this kind of like, uh, you know, recover half points on death, for example, it allows him to obviously see more variety in terms of how he is played. And obviously, you know, I think as we can all agree, the more ways there are to play cards in general, the better because it leads to more variety in the game as a whole. So, um, you know, I think that's, you know, even though it might sound like a convenient answer because it's what we just talked about, it, it really <laughs> kind of it is really genuinely the case. Fair to say. Uh, talking about changes... I know we've seen some big changes this year, so things like the gold targeting, for example, and all the big weather changes. Um, we've been told that there is some sort of update coming that required all of these cards to become agile. So the question here is, is that, because you mentioned with the tech update, they're not maybe big changes, but are, is Gwent likely to see more big changes to kind of the way that the game is played uh, in the near future compared to say you know once the game is maybe out of beta and is a bit more kind of once you've got everything kind of set up in terms of how you want the game to be working are we so are we likely to see more big changes in the future or does cdpr feel like the game in its current state is more or less how they want it as a foundation to build upon um it kind of depends what you mean because there's some very big visual upgrades coming in terms of like uh the VFX for the game, like the VFX, uh, as most people you know, can probably tell, many of them are placeholder. There's some things which are much better in quality than others, and that's definitely a big thing that will change over the, you know, I don't want to give any specific timeline. I'm just going to say over the coming months, which could be one month, it could be many months. Yeah, you, know, you know, it's something we're, we're, we've been working on for some time, and, you know, when that hits, it will really be a big visual quality upgrade for the game. Um, so, you know, that, that's in turn... I think the question is kind of twofold in terms of game mechanics and how the game as a whole plays. You know, there are some things that the tech changes will bring and there's some uh, different limitations there. Um, But in general, the game will play in a very similar manner. You know, we're not going to change core rules. uh, You know, we're not going to do anything crazy like make it two lanes instead of three and so on. Um, But, you know, the core game itself will very much be very similar to, to how it is now. However, you know, there are big things that will change, like VFX, for example. We're also, you know, we've been looking at uh, the game board itself, and that's all I can say on that subject. We haven't got anything to show or talk about at the moment that we're happy to do. But, you know, there's 
you know, we, we look at what our community feel and we listen to, well, at least we try to listen to what we think is, is what people want. And then we work on things that uh, we think will, you know, make people happy. And sometimes uh, that just takes a long time. So, you know, the, the VFX is definitely something that players will see and will like. And some of the other visual changes beyond that, uh, things that we hope people will really be into as well. Well, I, I have to... Um... <clears throat> I have to bring up, speaking of uh, making people happy, it occurs to me that we, we, are, um, we are not going to get out of this without at least mentioning the coin flip. Uh, because, you know, there's, there's going to be the, the viewer questions. I think it might be best to, uh, you know, get the, get, get, the, get the mention out of the way uh, at this time. Because people are, uh, I mean, that, that's obviously a very hot topic. Uh, you you went on the record last time uh, saying, Rethas, that you guys were, you know, trying around, you know, different different potential ideas. You, you floated the idea of, for example, something you were trying was like phantom points or something like that. Now, I mean, I don't really have a question. Is there literally anything you can say? <laughs> You're just coin flip. That, that's yeah. Swim's question. People, I mean, that's, chat Chat is saying coin flip. They don't really have a question, but they, they just want to say the word coin flip, and I kind of have to emulate that. So I, I'll say a few things, and, um, you know, I'm very hesitant to say things on this because they, they're going to be twisted out of yeah, it's, what I say, which is kind of ridiculous I've, because... I see that people say, like, the amount of threads that I read that are like, oh, Retha said coin flip doesn't matter, which, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is exactly not what I said at all. Um, so it's kind of odd, is how I'll phrase it. The first thing I will say, and I know there's going to be massive reaction to this, but it is the truth. The coin flip problem is overrated. It does not make 75% difference in your games. It's That's not a fact, and it never will be the case, and it never has been the case. It does make a difference, and that difference is more significant at the high end of the game than the low end of the game. And that's one of the reasons that we're hesitant to do something about it, because, you know... It, it does raise the barrier to entry for the game. That's one thing, because it's another thing that we need to explain. <clears throat> another thing as well is that... Um, any change that we make can <laughs> and potentially will destabilize the game more than it currently does. So, you know, we're kind of keeping track of how things go. And the way that we're dealing with it at the moment is that we have a plan in our tournaments to kind of experiment with a way of dealing with that. So the first time that anybody will see any kind of way to deal with that is in the upcoming CDPR tournaments. Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah, also, I you made the mistake. You though. said, you said, Rethas said the coin flip doesn't matter, which can then be cut to you literally just saying coin flip doesn't matter. Well, do you know, oh, what? Do you know, what? Do you know what I read the most times? I read that Swim wants to gun people down in the <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Swim, do you have anything to say? The funniest thing is, I don't, I, I don't, I don't I go actually, outside. I, I, I wouldn't even know anything about streets. But I actually, I, the funny thing is that the more I read that, the more hilarious it is because I actually was watching Merchant when he actually said that line originally. So wait, Merchant uh, said that? Yes, for sure. Unless I've lost my my memory somehow. I'm pretty sure that's where the meme comes from. It's people he said saying I you down in the streets. That's not what I said. But it was, it was a line that Merchant said something like this, and obviously jokingly, and then people basically meme it so that you said it. That's the joke, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's the kind of thing Merchant would say 100%. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could, so. I just, just to summarize, sorry to interrupt there on, on the coin flip. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. there, there are some really visceral and extreme reactions. And, um, you know, if you look at the, the I'm going to go point to a certain narrative that's pushed here sometimes. And when we, we had some tournaments, uh, if we go back to some of the tournaments earlier in the year, people would say, oh, you know, like 70% going second, coin flip is a huge issue. Then suddenly when the tournaments are 50-50, the sample size is too small uh, for the, people, the <laughs> same people quoting the issue. I mean, obviously the sample size is too small, but the sample size of the former tournaments was also too small. The general, um, you know, we have a lot of statistics on how this is going. And, and again, it does make a difference. 
you know, but in terms of like mass ranked play, that does even out in many ways. So while it might be very frustrating for people at an extreme high level, we are looking into solutions for that for tournaments at the moment. And like I said, there's we'll see some something there, and if that works out well, we'll you know we'll take it from there and see how it goes. And I think that is probably people's number one. Like probably why coin flip is as prevalent as an issue, or at least brought up as prevalent as it is, is just because people really like finding the one thing that can help them be like, okay, I lost the coin flip, that's why I lost the game. <coughs> uh, and it's nice hearing from CDPR that yes, the coin flip is causing uh, you know some uh, variance with games, but I am definitely looking forward to uh, whatever solutions you guys come up with because I I'd, I'd love to see you know less. I'd like to see less complaining, no matter what. <laughs> I think also the coin flip is most impactful in tournaments. Like in ranked, you play so many hundreds of games that even if it was impactful in the way that people said it was, you play enough games that it should even out across your hundreds or so of games. Um, whereas in tournaments, obviously, if you've got you know best of five, then you've got you've got you know there's there's chances that it could maybe count against you. So it's really like. Really good to hear from an esports perspective that that's something that we'll see in the next CDPR tournament, which is this month, right? I mean, the only caveat to that is, you know, the, there's always the potential that development uh, problems can cause that not to occur. I mean, we, we plan to have that, uh, but, you know, we'll have to see how it goes. And, you know, if it's not in, in this next tournament, it will be in, you know, the test for it will be in the next one. Uh, but, yeah. you know, genuinely, we really want to try and make that happen. And, and that is the plan. But, you know, sometimes development has unforeseen, you know, issues and you know, different things occur and can lead to other results. And I'd, I'd just like to shout out whoever uh, managed to help us correct our leaked uh, card art. It is definitely appreciated. We have it to correct it now. <laughs> it was. I got DM'd by Pabinci on the... Oh, my God. Oh, Pabinci. Yeah, Pabinci on, uh, on <laughs> Twitch. They, they DM'd me this work of art, and uh, that, that looks much more like an item to me. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I wanted to clarify one thing about the Bushir card that was leaked in the in the <laughs> These guys work fast. <laughs> so the Bushir card leaked to the dev stream. That's an actual card that's going in the game. That's yes. not a joke. Thank it's like you. a real. It's a real card, and it will be in the game. You guys Can... are putting putting a leak card in the in the game. No, no the uh, the Bushir card, card art. Yeah, but that's that a, leaks. But it's a real card that's it's... going in the game. I mean, you have other developers in the game already, right? Premium craft day one. Yeah, we yeah we do. Yeah, Rethas, when are you getting in the game? Uh, that will never happen. I think he already is. Yeah. Of course, <laughs> he already <laughs> is. <laughs> That's his skeleton. Oh, like, they, you know, it, it, it's it, perfect skeleton. likeness. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, in all seriousness, it's something that uh, is really cool to do for for people that work very hard on the project. And you know, I personally would would never put my own uh, visage in it because it's more something that you know I you know would like to do for other people rather than myself. So it's you know you can expect to see you know more people from the Gwent team kind of appear over time for sure. And you know we have some guys from some of the other supporting teams that have really helped us out. Like uh, we have one of our IT guys, which uh, he does a fantastic job in supporting the. Um, the events that we do he travels all over the world and sets up the computers and makes sure everything's okay and uh, you know his card art will be appearing uh, at some point as well Ooh. is that hmm? no, no 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 never mind I was, I was gonna guess who that was I don't know if you've <laughs> met I don't know if you've met him but his, his name is Matouche oh I haven't met him there you go I think the card arts, it's really impressive, the likenesses that the artists do of the of the different developers and stuff and different employees. And I think it's a, a really nice little Easter egg because I think some of them we won't know because, you know, we yep. only see certain faces within CDPR. Like there could be a bunch of cards that are already devs that we just don't realize are devs. Like your favorite uh, card, yep. like, like Renew, Al Renew Spearman. might be a dev. <laughs> I think it's Albert Spearman or Albert Pikeman. I can't remember one of them. Basically, it's the one in the snow. I can't remember. I always get the names confused. Pikeman. That's one of the. It's one of our developers. Oh, oh now I'm gonna Google it. Yeah, I'll track him down. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, I've, I've seen you before in Gwent. That would be such a weird experience to like meet someone and then be like, you look just like this card. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, dear. So I guess we have a little bit more time to touch on some more new card things. I don't think we're ever going to be able to talk about all of the new cards or oh, all yes. of the card Wait, changes. How many of them, how uh, many of them have we done? Like four? Like yeah, we did so well. Yeah. <laughs> Cruising. Yeah. <laughs> so then pick one. Me? Yeah. Oh, uh, how 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 do you feel about um, Foul Ale, Rethaz? Because that's that's another one of the most interesting ones that you guys have printed. Now it's speculating. We, you know, it, it's kind of been established that you guys have, you know, make decisions sometimes as kind of like testing the water as a bit of an experimentation. Um, I mean, what's is is, is like because Foul Ale is a more complicated card. Uh, I mean, it, it it sort of might be the most complicated card in the game so far i i almost don't know if i've seen an opponent that seems to have read it it's <laughs> no it's it, it's it's honestly it's one of those cards that it really challenges your reading comprehension and i feel like um i don't know it, it's quite interesting do you think that more cards like this might be printed how do you feel about it um, Foul Ale is very much a, a test of certain things. It's seeing how players feel about the, I mean, certain, you know, we've, te we tested the water with certain hand interactions and, um, you know, some interactions players don't really like, like there was a time when Dor uh, sorry, um, Donna and Hindar basically took a card out of your opponent's deck <laughs> to play it. And, you know, the, the reaction to that was quite visceral from players. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, with that, we tried messing with the opponent's deck. And people, oddly, people feel okay when Regis does it, but they don't feel okay when uh, Donna and Hinda did. And part of that is probably just due to the nature of Regis being gold. And therefore, you know, because he's gold, they're like, ah, okay. You know, he's gold. He did something very impactful. Maybe it's okay. And for a silver card, they kind of didn't feel that that was fair. Um, so, you know, we, we test out different things and this card's very much a test. We originally had it with a lower turn timer, but it felt very, very harsh when it was like that. So, you know, we'll keep an eye on this card and see how it goes. I mean, you know, sometimes, um, you know, this, this card is, I would phrase it as very interesting. It might not be something that's super competitive or, you know, might not see play at the moment, but I think, you know, maybe this card might need some tweaks. We'll have to see how it goes. But, uh, you know, the idea behind it is very interesting and uh, definitely could lead to other things in the future. Sounds cool. good. Deal. Pick a card. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Pick a card. I, card. I'd like to talk about Crow's Eye a bit because it's something that I, I think got a ton of discussion just because it got the uh, it, it hit simply the text of like yes it does extra damage depending on how many Crow's Eyes are in your graveyard up to ten damage and people are just like how do we do it how do we get as many <laughs> copies of this card in our graveyard uh, was that something that uh, is maybe a hint of future design space of allowing multiple copies of this card it, it, it was the ten number just something that. You know, you threw a dart at a board, and it's like, okay, up to ten. That sounds like a good number, just to just in case things get out of control. Like, what was the reasoning behind the up to ten damage? Uh, I mean, you know, certain things need to be capped for um, in, to, to make sure they don't kind of get out of control. And this is one of them because you know, in the future, there'll be more options to to make kind of multiple copies of things more viable. Um, you know, that's just a general thing that you can imagine is throughout the progression of the game will happen. It's, you know, quite possible that there will be a version of Operator in the future for special cards. So, you know, this kind of thing is to just make sure that we kind of um, don't let it get too out of control. So kind of planning ahead. That makes sense. My question is about Mandrake and Ooh. whether or not you need to change the art for the Chinese version of the game. <laughs> that is my question. <laughs> <laughs> um actually I, I think that we did but not why you think uh, <laughs> i honestly can't remember um but i think it's actually more to do with the sounds like some something you know obviously um you know the the censorship in china um you know we do have to change a lot of artworks but actually we have to change more sounds than anything else sounds yep because any there too because yeah, we have to I make mean, them speak Chinese. No, no, that's not that's not why it's actually not why at all. <laughs> Although, actually, the game is totally fully voiced in Chinese, um, so that's not an issue there. It's more about the um, you know, screams and cries of agony are not seen as kind of acceptable um, for the censorship there, so we have to change those. Oh, that's really interesting. I never realized that like sounds in that regard would be 
a census a censorship issue like other than you know swearing or changing the language for optimization i didn't realize that you also could have like screeching yeah. uh text is as well for example dandelions fluff text uh for example is not uh, is something we had to change so i'm sure some people can speedily go look up what uh, dandelions fluff text says but we had to change uh, that as well so there's quite a you know there's this it's it's really a big endeavor but um china is a really you know it's a really important market for the game and uh, it's Gwent is proving very popular there, and uh, you know we we have really dedicated Chinese fan base, and you know you can see at the top of the pro ladder. I think there was two guys from China in the top ten, I believe. I, th I think there was, or yeah. top top twenty at least for sure. Yeah, China China is a gigantic market. I've been I've been thinking about just like starting to stream on Panda instead of Twitch. You just stream to the Chinese. Mm. You don't just leave leave your uh, viewers behind. I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> So, do you want to talk more about cards, or is it time to open the floodgates to the unwashed masses and take questions from well, chat? Don't call them that. <laughs> you you permanently shout at me for shouting out chat, but when I say something mean about chat, you're like, oh, it'd be nice to chat. <laughs> I mean, we could talk about Hefty Helga and Ven and Del Elite before before we move on. I, I mean, oh. the the other cards are quite straightforward. I think Katori is, you know, he. I think he's really fulfilling the niche that we wanted him to. He's not too powerful. He's not uh, uh, too weak either. He's kind of working as he's intended. Um, and I think most of the other cards kind of are fulfilling their niches. Uh, you know, um, She Troll might be underperforming a little bit, uh, and. Yeah, we'll we'll keep we'll keep an eye on how that goes. I know there's some people concerned about muzzle. Um, again, I think, you know, muzzle is kind of one of those cards. I think that might be very predominant for now, but I I feel that might change over time. Yeah, we'll have to see how it goes. Um, but we could definitely talk about um, uh, Hefty Helga and Venendel Elite because I think there's there's de especially on Venendel Elite, there's definitely something to talk about there. But um, you know, Hefty Helga, we're generally really happy with how that card is is doing um it's good value uh, outside of uh, reveal and it's really good value in reveal as well yeah so, i think go ahead, well, what i like about helga is that it's similar to cynthia in that regard like cynthia you can play her just as cynthia in a deck and you'll get value out of her without having to have other reveal synergies and it's nice that that's something that cdpr are bringing to nilfgaard because nilfgaard uh, I think was one of the factions from a deck building perspective that felt a little bit kind of closed in some of their cards and that if you were running certain cards, you felt you know, almost that like you had to run certain other cards um, and they didn't have many cards like Cynthia or Hefty Helga where you could just run them and they work in more or less any deck. I mean, that's kind of a deliberate choice though, the um, forcing certain things into different archetypes because, I mean, people might complain about lack of variety and lack of um, diversity in the meta uh, I can tell you for sure when the game didn't have more very strict archetypes, it was far worse than it is now. Um, you know, there would generally be like one one deck for each faction, and that would be it. And people can argue that that's the case right now. It's not the case for sure. I mean, we have the statistics; we can see how it goes. And yeah, if you look at the top like a hundred players, maybe everybody's playing the same thing. But across the game in general, there's actually a really, really good faction distribution. And I mean, if you know people that don't want to believe my statistics, you can look at the different breakdowns of factions on Gwent up uh, over the last various months. The you know, if you go way back in time, it was like fifty percent playing one faction. And and that doesn't exist anymore. So it's better. And then we have the Ven Venom Venom Elite. Yeah. Venom Venom Venom. Elite. <laughs> that was Which, that was a card that a lot of people um kind of It's very out. controversial. I don't people, mind people, it. People freaked out about that card immediately. I I someone someone on Reddit put a put a clip of me like uh and the goes to swim. Yeah, for sure. And the what now? The Oscar goes to swim. It was very that reaction was pretty priceless. Yeah, well, I was I wasn't freaking out that the card would necessarily be OP. I was freaking out when they when they when they said it could be used on Cancerella. That's obviously a big deal. Um but it it it's the kind of card that is going to have a kind of limited time finding value. It's it's something that you can you can only really use, you know, a couple of times per game at most. And it's something that therefore, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people ended up kind of really overestimating. Also, you can counter it by playing the card that they reveal. Yes, which I mean, is kind of cool. The the way that card is working exactly kind of as we planned. It's 
basically it, you can take one of them in your deck pretty safely but even then you might end up with it being bricked as well i mean there's a video going around on reddit recently about uh, a guy basically i think he had hefty helga in his hand and he had uh, a venendal elite and the only way for him to play that is to basically you know target his own unit which uh obviously is the drawback of this card and um yeah, you know, I think that uh, right now reveal is very popular because of, of the buzz around this card, and I think throughout the meta, I think it will trend down towards more kind of health, healthier levels in terms of distribution. You know, we'll have to see how it goes, and we'll keep yeah. an eye on it. And you know, if it's something that players really, um, you know, if data and player reaction supports the same thing, you know, in in a couple of weeks from now, then maybe we'll take a look at it again. And you know, we're not afraid to change things if we need to, but. I genuinely don't think that will be the case here because players will discover that having three of these in your deck will lead to you playing them as a one. In yeah, yeah. No, it really, really not that great. Like, even my deck that ran two had them bricked a lot. And a lot of people are figuring out about the one point Cantarella, but it takes a lot of specific setup. You have to go out of your way to reveal Cantarella, which is not something yep. you know you typically gain value out of doing. And then you, you know, it's telegraphed. You have to play the Venandel Elite and then the Cantarella. We're in the strength of spies is about being able to play them whenever you want. And this is a three turn combo before you can even play your spy. The other thing that I think is a really big deal about this is that it doesn't <clears throat> weaken the target, it damages the target. So, for example, today, when my opponent played a 1-strength Cantarella, I then played Mandrake and had a 17-strength Cantarella, and everything was great. So it's also <laughs> counterable in terms of things like resets like Mardrib and Mandrake and Armorsmith, for example. There's a lot of different ways that um, even if they play a low-strength unit, you can kind of counter it to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I think it's gonna. I think it genuinely will be fine. I mean, again, we'll we'll keep an eye on it and see how it goes. But you know, this is very much a case of sometimes we see these visceral player reactions that um, you know, and it, it's really you know sometimes a bit disheartening. We saw some similar things with weather in the past, and mm -hmm. you know, I think. Um, you know, really, the, the best way for, for players to look at that is to really wait and see because I'm sure two weeks from now, people won't be complaining about Venendal Elites at all. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It already seems like people have kind of really fallen off. I remember there was a Reddit post on, I think it was day one, saying, you know, this this card is you know not, not what we feared slash hoped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it, you know, it really is going to turn out that way, but again, we'll have to see. So, viewer questions? As you wish. Only oh. for the uh, washed masses, though. <laughs> if you've showered today, <clears throat> you're allowed to ask Honestly, guys, here's, here's the thing, though. Like, if you haven't showered today, you can just say that you have, and we'll be forced <laughs> to believe that's what, you. That's what Swim does. It's, it's, it's like with those, with those sites that ask you, well... Oh, are you, you 18? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is that what you were going with? Not as oh. far as you know. <laughs> well, while we're waiting on those uh, viewer questions to come in, I do just want to bring up that uh, the next TGO is currently accepting signups. Uh, it's an extra special edition of the uh, Gwendolyn's Open, actually. It's Gwendolyn's Open Harpist, presented by Matthew J. Clority, uh, who has managed... It, he has single-handedly allowed us to double our normal prize pool. So it is a $500 prize pool for this tournament. Uh, and it is going to be the last of this flavor of the Gwendolyn's Open uh, series. So expect more tournaments from us, just not in this particular line. Uh, and it's also going to determine the last Gwendolyn's Open champion who's going to join the other seven uh, Gwendolyn's Open champions for the ultimate TGO champion uh, closed tourney at the end of the year. So that's going to be extra exciting. So this is going to be your last chance to get into that tournament if you are so inclined. And yeah. Also... Do we not have a special show match against Rethaz at some point? Is we should have a yeah. That was that was that was kind of in the works. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure if we're. I mean, R R Rethaz, you you had uh, said said at one point that your your team, you and two of your boys, would uh, would go against the winners of the TGI. Those being Team Pixie, uh, it's Crash Overlord. I'm in a bear yeah. suit and Don Coro. Don Coro. Yeah. So I mean, if yeah, yeah are, we, are you we still amenable to that? We can figure it out. Okay, great. We'll have a we'll make it a whole we'll make a whole thing about it. I'll cast it. <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be very exciting. I like how Swift's like I've got this. We'll, we'll cast. It's gonna be great. There are a lot of questions, so feel free to pick and choose. 
Oh, I think you guys should just pick the questions. You're asked to pick ones. Oh, okay. yeah. Ben, ben picks the sensible ones, and I always yeah. pick the dumb ones. So, I, so I'm looking first. very hard for some sensible ones. I'd like someone <laughs> else to go first. Come back to me. <laughs> oh, man, my chat's, like, going like this. One sec. Jaggers, you, you you're handling the dumb ones. You, you dude, you've got. So your, I can just you, pick any question. Yeah, just pick any. You're, you, you've got this. Oh, this is a good question. My <laughs> uh, what is the balance between card law in terms of the characters and in the game, and how they're kind of it says balanced in the game, but also how they're placed into the game. So, uh, in terms of like, for example, when we talked about new cards, there's definitely some law elements in. Uh, Ron Vid of Small Marsh, in that you know he comes back, which is just like you see in Witcher. Like how much role, how big of a role does law take when it comes to designing cards? Uh, it generally plays a pretty big role. It depends on the card. I mean, some cards are much more um, amenable to it than others. I mean, Ron Vid is, you know, it was just a natural choice that he would you know have to work like in a way where he comes back continuously you know people can say that oh we shouldn't do that because that should be something that's in Skellige or whatever the case is but it you know it would be a really missed opportunity and I think players would immediately um say that you know uh, why doesn't he come back and fight you like in The Witcher 3 um and I actually I was watching a there was um a video from a GDC from uh, Magic the Gathering uh, recently about the like 20 lessons they've learned. And one is, you know, sometimes you should just give players what they want. And this is very much a case of that. Like players would want Ron Vid to come back and try and, you know, f you know, mimic the scenario that they were used to seeing in The Witcher 3. And therefore, it's just an obvious choice. So, um, you know, we, we try to adhere to things that make a lot of sense. Uh, and sometimes that's not necessarily always possible. And, uh, you know, we just try to figure it out uh, to keep a good balance between the two. But at the end of the day, if something is going to be like massively unbalanced, then it probably will have to change. I remember watching that same exact video from GDC. Mm -hmm. It was pretty uh, scintillating stuff. A lot of people want to know what happened to Kahir's voice. I was that that was yeah. <laughs> Rethas, a lot of people want to know what happened with Kahir's voice. Any comments? Uh, honestly, I'm not actually sure about that one. I I've seen it, but uh, I haven't actually had a chance to listen to it yet. Um, so uh, I think you know generally the way uh, our voice recording works is that uh, you know we do things in batches. So it's possible Kahir just had some placeholders uh, from The Witcher Three, and maybe now he has uh, some freshly recorded ones, but. You know, uh, sometimes these things are changed for various reasons. Sometimes it's to do with contracts with actors and various other things as well. So there's a whole multitude of reasons as to why it might have changed. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's, I know for some players it might be, uh, you know, a big change. But I think, you know, it's, maybe it's okay and it doesn't matter that much. Uh, will there be separate kegs for big expansions so at the moment we just have regular kegs is is there going to be different kinds of kegs in the future <clears throat> relating to different card expansions uh i can't really answer questions about uh, monetization uh future monetization potential stuff at this time that's fair enough uh why are you always represented by the card art for scorch uh, is it your favorite card art uh i think so in some ways yeah i think um you know, it's a very early card artwork that we did for for Gwent, and um, you know, it's just it's very, it's just very cool, and uh, you know, it's very it's just something that's kind of been my avatar since the start of Gwent, and it was because we actually um, some of you might know actually that we we when we do business cards, we get to choose a, a piece of artwork, and originally I chose uh, actually Villain Trettenmurth, and that had kind of already been assigned to, to somebody else, um, and therefore my second pick was actually Scorch, so. Oh, so That's your second choice. <laughs> yeah, my, my original was Villain Trethenmurth, and unfortunately uh, it had already been assigned to somebody else. Oh, I have a question. It's not one from chat. How do you, how do you feel about being like CDPR's heel? If we call Berza, she is a, a wrestling reference. <laughs> Berza is the face oh, of Gwent, oh, and Rethas is the heel. Like, how do you? Because so, for those who don't understand, in wrestling, you have good guys and bad guys. Good guys are faces, and bad guys are heels. And then the good guys, the faces, are made to look good by the bad guys, the heel. But you need to have a bad guy for people to, I guess, target, so that then they cheer more for the faces. That's the question. Like every community, I think, <clears> in gaming, 
seems to have a bad guy and somehow that's become you, Rethos. So oh my god. That is the question. <laughs> uh, that's the question. I, I think I think that depends on who you ask, to be honest. Um I don't think you're a bad guy, Rethos. No, I don't think I don't think you're a bad guy either. But I think like <laughs> based on the community. Maybe I can also I don't that, I that, don't think you're a bad guy, but I think that very I think that very I think that very, very much depends on who you ask. I mean <clears throat> The reality is that I respond to things in a very frank manner, which a lot of people aren't used to from developers. If somebody says something about the game, which is just totally untrue, then I counter them and tell them it's not true. And, uh, you know, there's really over the past year, there are thousands of examples where I have admitted that we did a mistake with the game or we could do something better. And people just like to gloss over those and pretend that, like, those don't exist, like coin flip doesn't matter, as an example, um, which obviously isn't the case uh, based on multiple uh, documented uh, discussions. Um, you know, I think that for some people, they just expect me to listen to everything that they say and agree with them, and that's not going to happen because, you know, I, I'm myself, the team are very experienced, and you know, we know what we want from the game, and obviously, player feedback is very important, but. There's a big difference between constructive feedback, which we do get a lot of, and we've had some really great constructive feedback. I mean, there was a recent example that somebody pointed to about the light longship. The light longship was, um, you know, it working on deploy is actually something that came from a player suggestion, and we implemented that based upon, you know, just kind of making it a little bit easier to use so that it doesn't, it isn't so slow. Um, and you know, there's it's really easy to track that example, and there's a whole bunch of other examples like that that come from player feedback. However, you know, you know, personal attacks and threats and various other things, they're not cool and not acceptable. And you know, so we get we get both. I think. And I, I tend I tend to defend myself as well, which a lot of people aren't used to from developers. You know, if somebody launches personal attacks on me, then I stand up to that. It's because again, I. I just don't think it's acceptable to, to do that. I mean, I wouldn't come to your workplace and do the same thing. I know people do it to you, Swim. I'm sorry for that, but, you know, no, it's, it happens. It's, 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 a, it's a living. I think that with a community, if you're a face in the community, there's just, there's always going to be people who are like that. I just feel like, I think unfairly, Rethaz gets a lot more than most, like, other people I've seen. Ah, it's okay. I mean, you know... The reality of it is that, uh, you know, there's good feedback and bad feedback and just, you know, just how it goes. Oh, people want to know about Bloody Baron. And I guess this ties into gold cards. So gold cards that have effects um, that aren't just deploy effects and also Bloody Baron in, in his own way. People are, I guess, feeling like they're being maybe a little bit neglected, like Siri or Yennefer or Triss uh, Butterfly Effect. Is this something that CDPR are looking to improve upon or change? Uh, I mean, those cards in general are quite dangerous, some of them. I mean, there's been metas where Triss Butterfly really got out of control. <clears throat> and you can say, oh, just make her a 10, and then it's okay. And then she's probably going to be way too good. And it's a very fine balance between those cards. I mean, Siri, again, as an example. <clears throat> Siri is a totally viable card. I mean... These cards depend on if your opponent has a counter to them, and those are very meta-dependent. I mean, if we suddenly made Siri a lot more points, she's probably going to be in every single deck, and I don't think you want that scenario um, as players. You, you really don't want that scenario because it just means that it's a, the game in many ways becomes a fight for card advantage even more than it currently is. Um, so, you know, the, these cards have their niches and have their uses, and also in other game modes, they might see a lot more play. Hmm. So there's a the the six square tell mains in chatter are spamming. Uh, why is Dragoon <clears throat> row locked still? I mean, it won't be. Well, there you have it. That's, it's not really uh, a leak because considering you know we're moving considering towards what now? considering we're moving towards everything being agile, obviously. Oh, everything being agile, obviously. Yeah, yeah that's not really a leak. Okay. Well, uh, here's really. another here's another one uh, from chat question. Um, with the change of the patch to harpies uh, now only spawning whenever a beast dies, is it intended that they are spawning in between rounds? Uh, it's not. There's some weirdness there, and there'll be a, a hotfix which is focused on bugs. I don't know when that will go live exactly, but it will definitely be, and it's not soon TM. It, it really will be soon, um, which means you know within 
within the next week for sure. Um, Ooh, for and, sure. You know, so th- there's a few things to, to fix there, and uh, I can I can bring up a quick list of some of those things, actually. Um, unfortunately, the light long chip regresses to f- uh, six rather than five. Um, that's something that we fix. <clears throat> there's, a, there's an issue which occurs sometimes when playing how the Hound Snout uh, that leads to uh, an unresponsive state. That will be fixed. Um, See if it happened to me. <laughs> yep. Uh, there was reports of uh, Morin interrupting Hattori's deploy that proved to be false, though. It just He resurrects based on his current power on the deploy, so it might be a little bit confusing. Um, the oh, so he could a- only resurrect like a one, but there was no yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Harpy has a few issues which will definitely be fixed. Uh, there's a few tooltip errors here and there with uh, Mahakamel, Han Marvin's Blue Dream, uh, Hemdal. Um, and Vilmar doesn't trigger on uh, destroy effects, which uh, is just some, like I said, there's some really weird tech stuff that's, uh, you know, it really takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to iron out all those issues, which will be much better in the future. So for various reasons, Vilmar, the skull, doesn't actually trigger on destroys, but does trigger on being just damaged. Um, and there's some other slight issues as well that will be fixed. There mm. might be a, a couple of balance tweaks in there. We'll we'll see how the the meta develops. Uh, you know, uh, at least over the next uh, day or so. Will Ceres see a rework since Venandel does basically its job but better in a similar way to how Brayden got buffed uh, because she would have been redundant with Banana Dude. Uh, possibly there might just be some value tweaks there as well. We'll we'll Ooh. see how how things develop because Venandel Elite, while it uh, you know, people are thinking that it's like super auto include at the moment. It definitely won't turn out that way. And you know, Serret is more flexible in his own way with dealing six damage. It's it's possible we could just push Serret to seven damage and maybe reduce his base by one. We'll have to see. Um, you know, we 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 pushed Serret's value a little bit on purpose to see the the kind of result of what would happen there. And um, yeah, we'll see how it turns out. Yeah, no, I I think it's a, a pretty fantastic uh, direction you guys are going in with both the Venandel Elites and the Dolphana Swords Masters. Uh, I've gone on the record saying that a lot of cards, I mean, some, something you've seen happen about a dozen times over the course of the game's history is that like a gold or a silver card has basically been put onto onto a bronze. And pretty much whenever that happens, it's it's a pretty great thing for you know deck building and archetype diversity. Yeah, I think you know, um, we, you know, uh, there was some criti- there was some criticism about the lack of bronzes in this update, but I think people forget that the majority of updates for a considerable uh, past have actually been focused almost entirely on bronzes. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to add some other things to the game at this time, but you know, obviously there's a lot of bronze cards coming. They are the foundation of the game, and uh, you know, over the you know, various months, there's definitely going to be uh, you know large additions to the bronze card pool. Sounds good. I think look forward to. most of the other questions are things that we've covered, like when yeah, there'll be technical like changes, it. which is in the tech update, and and those sort of questions that we kind of covered earlier on in the talk show. So you should have been here. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you weren't, then you get a chance to uh, check out the uh, YouTube VOD, which will go up shortly after this. Uh, yeah, this was, they were too busy showering. <laughs> <so> <laughs> 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 Uh, if you wish, we can do a few more questions. There is one thing I wanted to cover that was posted in. There was the thread that Ruben posted about um, on Reddit earlier about oh, the Reddit uh, thread. Yeah, on the show there was some uh, questions about um, avatars and uh, exclusivity. So you know, I said a long time ago that the general idea was that the um, the ranked rewards are alternate versions of the main artworks, which still holds true. So, for example, Eridan, you know, you can see the Eridan reward for the next season. Uh, the main Eridin will be added to the game at some point, and he'll have a helmet. So the alternate Eridin is the Eridin without the helmet. So, you know, you can take the logical assumption there from all of the seasonal uh, um, avatar rewards, they're going to have their, like, main costumes added to the game at some point. So this is, I guess, the idea that there'll always be an accessible version, just not every version. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's <clears> something <throat> that we we committed to, and it will be the case, and it will remain the case. It's just right now they're kind of released out of order, and um, you know that will change when they're added to the game. 
there's a lot of avatars and borders and various other things in the works and um you know there's there's really you know right now there's already quite a few of them in the game and there's just going to be lots more basically can I we feel like I was going to say, can we expect no. to see more positive voice lines in the future? Because I think it, it a lot I of think... the taunts feel a bit, I guess, like, it's not, for example, a hello or just like a greeting one. Some of them can can maybe come across as a bit uh, negative. I mean, they, they are called taunts. <laughs> yep, exactly. That is There's an option to mute them all. But yeah. what, if, what, what, if, uses. <laughs> what if I want to interact with my opponent in a very friendly way? Like, what if I, mean, I just want to kind of like wave? It kind of depends on the character that you're playing as. Some of the characters' lines are much more friendly than others, and I think people just focus on certain characters and that those are negative. I mean, you know, if you're playing a game against Dandelion, I wouldn't really expect him to be anything other than snarky and, uh, you know, have some attitude. So I think it depends on very much on the character. And also, uh, I mean, another thing is as well, like, if we were to put very nice greetings in the game, people would just use them in a negative manner anyway. Yeah, that is true. So, I mean, you know, the, there are different voice lines and there will be different voice lines for different characters as time goes on. Um, you know, I think in the future, one of the kind of tweaks we have planned there is for uh, characters to have slightly modified voice lines based upon who their opponent's avatar mm -hmm. is. Um, so, you know, th those change things up as well. It's pretty How cool. <clears throat> One more question. How does progression work to the Pro Ladder if the change is ranked seasons are meant to be changed to one month, but Pro Ladder seasons are meant to stick at two months? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I'm not really involved in the Pro Ladder stuff, though, so I, I can't really, I, I'm not really comfortable answering those questions because I might give out some information which is wrong. But okay. um, as far as I'm aware, the Pro Ladders are still planned to be two months and the normal seasons are one month long. I'm not sure how the transitions to that will work, but I'm sure uh, you know um, our PR guys will probably clarify that in the near future. Okay, now, sounds good. A, lot of, uh, a couple of people in chat are asking, uh, why is Manticore an 11 if, uh, if, if Geralt... If, a 13 if Geralt, vanilla Geralt, is also a 13. A lot of times, like, what you'll see happen is, like, you know, when when things are buffed up, it, it's the same deal as Ceres, Ceret, right? Like, Ceret got kind of left behind because something else was buffed that made it, you know, feel worse. Uh, and Geralt is kind of the same way. Even though Geralt isn't really better than before, or it isn't worse than before. I don't know. Re Rethaz, what's your um, comment on that? Uh, I mean, first of all, Geralt is a neutral. He's also a starter card. Um, so those are definitely factors that play into his uh, power level as well. Uh, I mean, you know, Geralt doesn't necessarily... Geralt, people often say, that uh, why is Geralt so weak? I mean, he's not. He has four, I think, yeah, is it four versions, three versions of Geralt at the moment. I, I can't remember. Yeah. But there's, you know, there's even more versions of Geralt planned for the future as well, which all have their own unique and powerful abilities. I mean, you know, in some ways, Igni is one of the most powerful cards in the game. Um, you know, it's incredibly good. And Ard has definitely seen its day in the sun as one of the most powerful cards in the game as well. Um, so, you know, Geralt has his, his own, uh, you know, other cards, which are very powerful. Um, and... You know, we'll see how things go. It's possible we might push him to 14. It's something that we've already actually discussed. Um, that has some repercussions that, you know, may be good, may be mm -hmm. bad. It's, you know, time will tell and we'll see how it goes. I mean, the man, we're very interested to see the Manticore's play rates for this patch uh, at his power level. And, you know, if they're okay, then, you know, it's probably okay to push Geralt. And if they're, you know, too much, then probably not. So Geralt Bathtub is basically confirmed, you guys. We got it. Thank God for that. Uh, the other question then is with patches of, of ranked seasons becoming one month, will that mean more regular patching in terms of this sort of patch where we got 21 new cards at the end of the season? We've typically seen, you know, these kind of new card patches come at the end of a season. But if the season's already one month, does that mean we'll get more frequent patching? Um. In terms of content, I honestly can't really say. Uh, in terms of seasons, I mean, generally, we kind of have to do patches for the way seasons work. Um, so technically, there will be patches. Whether those patches will contain new content is a bit of a different story. Um, you know, we, like I said, we have, you know, plans to add a lot of features to the game still. It's, it's you know, definitely not complete at this time. And uh, some of those will coincide with new seasons and some of them may not.
I think there's something that uh, sometimes gets critiqued, and I think actually, uh, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I think my general perception is that it's really from a minority of users. I think the majority of users would prefer new content quicker rather than waiting for the end of a season in many cases. If you had to wait like you know six weeks for content rather than it being released when it's ready, I think you would probably choose the release when it's ready. So you know, with seasons moving to a month long, that probably in some ways makes it kind of easier to release content. It does have some ramifications on the pro ladder, but I think, you know, again, as I said, if, if players are going to need to wait six weeks for us to release uh, a new content when we could have released it earlier, I definitely think they would prefer, you know, the former. Mm. That's true. And ultimately pro ladder players should be good at adapting to changes in the meta anyway, if they're on the pro ladder, that that's the, the suggestion anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I really think so. And I, I don't think we actually had... Uh, again, I could be wrong, but I don't think we had complaints from the pro players about that. I think that uh, you know they, they often relish change and find it exciting because it you know makes the game definitely fresh and interesting for them. I think the pro ladder is a good example of in Gwent when the community has been up in arms about something and then it's happened and everyone's been kind of chill because I remember when it was first announced, people were you know complaining that it was unfair to have this exclusive ladder that uh, you know only certain players got access to, and now it's it's kind of happened and it's a ladder where you have to play four hundred games, and the people who aren't in the pro ladder are like, oh well, you know, I'll just play regular ladder. Like it was it was made to be a much bigger deal than I think it was in the grand scheme of things. I think definitely the um, yeah you know, the pro ladder. It- is, isn't for everybody and that's okay i mean there are different types of players again like the ranked ladder generally for for people should be very rewarding we've purposely engineered the rewards there to be very generous both in terms of how me, how much you get when you rank up how much you get at the end of the season the amount of vanity customizations you know there's arguments to say that we could make some of those vanity customizations available for more of the populace and maybe that's something we'll do we'll, you know as time goes we've actually brought down the requirements for those a little bit and again we'll see how it goes but having drivers to get to a high rank obviously gives people a goal whereas if we gave all the rewards away at like rank 10 i mean for many people there wouldn't be this driver to try and get higher so yeah that's kind of the reason um you you know a lot of those rewards are tied to being higher ranks because it you know it's achievements it pushes people to to try and do to get higher to do more are there, speaking of, I guess, rewards, are there plans for any new kinds of rewards, such as maybe alternate card arts for specific cards? Yeah, no, I mean, at the moment, we already have different versions of Queen's Guard, for example, but you could have maybe a card art that was an alternate version of, uh, art version of Geralt, but does the same thing as Geralt that you could maybe unlock through the pro ladder or something, you know, just this is just an idea, but other ideas for new kinds of vanity items that aren't titles and borders and icons. We um, we actually thought a long time ago about doing alternate card arts for things, and obviously the triptychs are kind of evidence of that. And I definitely think that's something that we've moved away from, and I don't think we'll go back to it. Uh, logically, for the you know for the investment that um, it, the amount of time it takes to make a card and a premium card, it honestly doesn't make a lot of sense. I think the average player would much rather that we release a full new card for everybody rather than a special limited edition artwork. And I'm not saying we'll never do that, but it's definitely something that uh, you know we're not super keen to do. Maybe you know for the world masters winner or something we might do something super cool like that but uh i, I don't think uh, in general it's something we'd like to do i see a bunch of people posting card backs and such like and things like that i mean it's not something that's going to be there right now but there's a lot more customization that we think that we well that we know that we want in the game and some of that relates to how the board looks and some of that relates to how the cards look and um there's definitely a lot of things coming but uh you know Making high quality uh, stuff really takes a lot of time, and uh, we have some very talented people focused on doing that. And you know, if people uh, you know can can uh, bear with us, and uh, we really appreciate the patience, then definitely there'll be some uh, cool things for the future for everybody. And it's all about those card fronts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I know a lot of people are saying leaks and stuff, but we've actually talked about a lot of this stuff a lot. So um, it's not really leaks; but it's just uh, you know information kind of uh, being said again let them have their leaks it makes them happy otherwise uh, otherwise yeah, they'll not, not, more. well not, not not everybody knows you know not none of everybody has you know there's, there's no like um 
There's no like Complete universal sentences. resource. Huh? <laughs> there's, there's no there's no like universal resource for like all of the information about the game's future that has been. Uh... No, that that's true. But uh, you know, there's definitely some consistent things that we've talked about. You know, other game modes, the single player. Um, there's a single player. <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Well, speaking of things that uh, we have talked about and not talked about, was there anything uh, specifically during the show, Rethos, that uh, you had hoped was going to be brought up but never actually did get brought up? Oh, my God, Dale, your questions are so hard. (laughs) Sorry. Um, To be honest, I'm kind of surprised that there aren't more questions about other factions. Um, you know, maybe maybe some players don't think the game needs more factions. Maybe that's why. Um, I think you know factions are generally uh, something super interesting that adds a lot to the game. You know, generally we launch a whole new set of mechanics and such. So I think maybe I'm surprised that uh, questions about other factions don't come up more. So if we were, so to how, get how about faction, those what, other uh, factions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the nice. question is very, now very other smooth. factions. Question mark. It's like coin flip question mark. Other factions question mark. That's <laughs> this is what you've created. Indeed. Didn't they say they said Tucson was part of Nilfgaard? I'm pretty sure I yeah. read that somewhere. But yeah, what about Zeracania question mark? <laughs> Uh, so the Tucson is part of Nelfgaard for sure. And uh, at Gamescom uh, this past year, actually, they showed the Anna Henrietta artwork. So she's definitely a uh, part of Nelfgaard. And she's actually a leader as well for uh, those that might not be aware. Oh, well, yeah, we did see some. We saw two new leaders, right? Anna Henrietta and... Deadlaff. Dead, yep. uh, see, Deadlaff might not be a leader, though. No, Ooh. I'm not sure that was said. He's definitely a card, though. Oh, Ooh. Ooh. Mm-hmm. that's not really. <laughs> I'm still holding out for peasants faction. Like that was my dream. Peasants. Oh, there's there, there's faction. there's a there's a peasant card coming. Uh, yeah, see that that's that kills my dream though. So let's not do that. Just scrap <laughs> that card and just make a peasant faction instead. Breath out. Like you got my back. I totally believe. Unfortunately, I I just don't think there's enough cards to fill out a peasant faction. No, prob- probably not. Yeah, but uh, if you combine peasants with cows, then we're getting somewhere. <laughs> well, peasants with general... farmyard animals. Yeah, it's farmyard animals, I was going to say. That sounds like a terrible faction, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, there's geese running around all over in Gwent, so, you know, you got there's plenty to draw from. To be fair, from... the, the peasant card does have a goose in it, actually. Ah, so. <gasps> oh, so, well, there you go. All is forgiven. Ah, oh, leak. I, I, I expect that detail to be in the, like, you know, Reddit overview of the... <laughs> <laughs> of, of the leaks in this, in this uh, peasant card, peasant card featuring, featuring goose. goose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then it's going to have a premium goose. You, like, you got to think about the bigger picture here, Swim. <laughs> uh, Are we good with questions? I, I think uh, so. I mean, uh, me. honestly, if you guys have a bit more time, I can do a few oh. more. It's really, I mean, since I'm here, may as well make use of the time. I'm, I'm positively made of time, Rathaz. We always have time. It's obviously just not keeping you for like three no, hours it's, or something it's, answering. It's, it's totally okay. It's we no could problem. just we could do this all night. Like I'm I I have no, nothing on my schedule. Someone's asking about Witcher one cards. I guess so. Is there going to be more cards from earlier Witcher games slash Witcher books? Uh, yeah, I think generally we do the same kind of thing that we have done in the game so far. There's a mixture of things from The Witcher 1, The Witcher 2, The Witcher 3, and also from the books. Um, and that, you know, that's only going to continue to go along the same way. I mean, we've really exhausted, I think, a lot of things from The Witcher 3. So you definitely can expect to see more things from um, the books and uh, especially The Witcher 1 as well. The, the Witcher 1 is really a gold mine of, of kind of untapped resources. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, you know, I saw somebody mentioning some things from uh, Salamandra here as well. Like, I mean, that's a perfect example of somewhere we could explore as well. There's, there's really a lot of cool things in The Witcher 1 that um, we haven't explored yet, which we definitely could. Isn't that a Yu-Gi-Oh card? I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe that's a Salamandra. No, no, no. I thought that was that was the that was the one Joey played. I don't know. You just remind okay. me. Well, I thought, yeah. I was going to joke about Weevil, but never mind. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask this question because it's been asked 80 million times. 
Will Lambert be able to target unlimited copies and not just buy? <laughs> um, I don't know. We'll we'll see. I mean, sometimes limiting things is good, and sometimes limiting them is bad. I mean, we were genuinely genuinely concerned of Lambert kind of getting too out of control in his value against certain things, and we've seen you know cards without limits sometimes really. Uh, be far too powerful um you know the ballista at one point was an example of that where its it shelves were unlimited um and uh, there was a few other examples i think um yeah i'll take savage bear as one of the examples of uh kind of <laughs> targeting so you know we, we try to be careful with that and um we don't want it to you know to lead to results like i mean of an entire faction not being played like uh, consume for example was just not not really played during the um savage bear meta because you lost so much value oh here, here's a here's a great question right has mentioned something about visual update in the future will it include effect update for card interactions such as damaging effects etc that's specifically what i meant yes so when Maybe when we took that when we, of a question then. <laughs> well no, it's I mean <laughs> if they needed to be clarified, maybe I need to explain it uh, better. I mean the general idea is that right now, I mean uh, when you you know when you target something, there's you know a lightning bolt effect and there's kind of a physical projectile effect. Those in general um, are, are placeholder, and you know you saw some examples in the current uh, holiday event of some more custom effects. I mean those are kind of semi placeholder as well, and uh, we definitely want to do much more custom things. So for example, you know if you use a ballista and you, it shoots a bolt it should look like that if you have a trebuchet and it launches some you know some uh, boulders or whatever the case may be it should look like that and that's the general idea of where the game will get to um just it, it takes a lot of time to do all those cool things and uh you know the team have had some other priorities um and they're getting to it and it will hopefully be really cool and, and really you know add a lot of visual polish and upgrade to the game when it happens there's a heck of a lot of different cards <clears throat> to do effects for, if, if that's what you're going down the route of. But then we have things like Ragnarug, for example, which has a really cool looking effect. So I, I'm assuming that's the sort of thing we can expect to see in the future with these kind of effect changes. Yeah, I mean, some things are, uh, can be applied to multiple things. I mean, you have like, you know, we have two types of trebuchet and the mangonel is also the kind of same thing, plus catapult as well. So the four of those things can, in, at least to some degree, probably share the same effects. Um, you know, every archer in the game probably would have the same kind of archery effect as well. Um, so, you know, there's obviously groups which leads to um, less kind of, uh, um, you know, unique effects. Obviously, it will in total be a lot of unique effects, but uh, it's it, in some cases they definitely will be replicated. And oh, it will be a lot of custom stuff. Here's a, a fantastic question. I actually love this one. What is one mechanic that the dev team experimented with but never made it into the game? Kind of like, you know, examples of which being consume, mulligan, reveal, etc. Ooh. Yeah, right? Oh. I, yeah, I think I, I've actually talked about this before, so for some people it might be um, a bit of a, a boring story, but um, at one time we had a card, that I think it was uh, one of Avalax actually, and basically it gave you a choice and it gave your opponent a choice was the idea. So um, it was like a, you know, Rock kind of traditional scissors? Not really, it was more like low, medium, high. And you'd have to like, <laughs> bet on uh, the amount of points. So, you know, if I, ch let's just, for this example, say that like it's, you know, a 5, 10, and 15, right? And Avalak will be played as um, kind of whatever I choose. But if you chose the same as me, then it would either go to the bottom amounts of points or the, or maybe he would go to your side and I would lose him completely. So the general idea was him to kind <laughs> of be like a, his own mi mini bidding game. Um, and we tried it out and it just didn't work because you just always like, I mean, the, basically, you know, the opponent would just always pick the highest and you would just always pick either the medium or the lowest. And because, you know, you would never pick the medium uh, in most cases, it, it kind of just didn't really work as, a, as, a, as an interactive mechanic as well as we thought it would do. This is the kind of mechanic that works super well in person when you're playing like a, a board game or something like that, because you can see the other person's face and the bluffing and the kind of, you know, you, 
you would use voice to obviously kind of like goad them into maybe going for the highest one rather than the lowest one and so on and so forth. So it just didn't translate well to a digital medium. And uh, yeah, that's why it didn't work out. Maybe it would have been better if there were friendly taunts. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Lazy, yeah. <laughs> oh. Let's go with that one. I like these one word question mark questions. These are easy because I don't have to think too much about them. Mobile question mark. Uh, I mean, that's not something that uh, we're ready to talk about at this time. Um, you know, we're focused on the console and uh, PC versions of the game. And, uh, you know, who knows what the future holds. We get a lot of questions that are kind of like that. Like, the, the things that have been covered before. And then, so then it's like, do we ask these questions to you again? Or do no, we that's fine. So, okay, so he's fine. So you guys <laughs> can ask. Yeah. Actually, I'm not going to say that. The last <laughs> Here's another uh, mechanics-oriented question. Will we ever see orders return? Uh, I think the mechanic was cool, but perhaps not with muster effects. Uh, I'm not sure. It's possible, but actually, that's um, it, it's kind of very tied to the single player, actually, the um, orders ability, uh, because single player very much focuses around like evolving your leader and uh, kind of different leader abilities. So... Uh, it might not make an, a reappearance or at least a major reappearance in multiplayer, but it definitely will be something players will see in single player. Uh, new board is another question. So I guess people want to see visual updates to the board. Uh, I mean, maybe those people weren't uh, watching at that time, but I kind of mentioned that earlier in the show uh, that we basically, you know, it's something that we're definitely paying attention to and looking at. And again, it's kind of weird because I often see um, there was, uh, it was about a month ago, there was a suddenly a lot of uh, posts about the game, the game board needing an update, which hadn't really happened before. And the replies in general were like, oh, CDPR doesn't care and won't update the board. And I don't really know where that came from because that's definitely not something that we as a company have said i mean you know a lot of things in the game have got visual upgrades over time and uh, the game is very much uh, you know something that we iterate on and improve upon and the game board itself is definitely something that pro- i mean you know i, I can't say we'll 100 percent do that right now but uh, as a team we definitely are paying attention to that and looking at where, what we can improve there that's cool. the point when uh, the community runs out of things to complain about, that's why that happened. Is they ran out of things to complain about, they're like, "Hmm, the car, the board. That's something we can complain about. Like, we got to have something." <laughs> that's what's the only a, reason it happens. It, it, what's, it, what's it's a good up? sign when when your community is complaining about like visual stuff. You you've made it. <laughs> so, let's uh, one up the one word questions. Spectator mode question mark. Uh, I think uh, again, um, you know. It's not meaning to be rude to say that we've talked about that before or anything. It's just really so that people, you know, know this is something that's like uh, we we have talked about um, and have committed to before. Um, it's definitely something that's on our radar to work on for the future, um, and it, it just isn't the priority right now. That we have more important things to do: um, game modes, cards, etc. And those things are more important than that. I think. You know, for some players, uh, replay and spectator features are very important. But I, you know, I think if you could have a choice of a new game mode or a spectator feature, you'd probably pick the new game mode. Hmm. This is a fantastic question. Which card has the greatest discrepancy between community outrage and the card's actual eff- uh, and, and the card's actual effect on like play rate, win rate, etc. Uh, and and I'm I'm gonna say like historically. Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Hmm. Give me a I'm, I'm sure there have been the good ones. Maybe uh, you you guys should chip in on that while I historically think about that for the moment. That's a, a doozy. Coin flip. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I feel like recently Woodland Spirit was like one that people like to complain about when the problem wasn't really with Woodland so much as with harpies. Um, yeah, that's that's very fair. And similarly with uh, Hailstorm, when Hailstorm didn't get like Hailstorm didn't get changed and become OP, there were changes made in the game that caused it to be as strong as it was. And I think that happens a lot in Gwent: is cards themselves don't get buffed and suddenly become OP. Other things get changed, and those things changing make cards OP, or in the eyes of the community, uh, which makes it very hard to balance because you kind of can't preempt every single way that a card could be played in interaction with another card when you have like nearly 400 cards in the game. 
I think uh, a key point there as well is generally a lot of it's about perception, uh, really, because Marigold's Hailstorm was the same for a very, very long time. And and the reality of that is that um, it was very powerful all, all of the time, and it still is very powerful. And it suddenly like dropped off on play rates, even though the change that we made to it was really quite minor. Um, I think that if you look at some of the skeleton decks at the moment with um, uh, the Whale Harpooner, I mean, there's a lot of points on one row, and Marigold Tailstorm would, in a lot of cases, get you a lot of points still. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of it, it just is, is uh, really based on community perception, and kind of things go in phases, and players are very interested in certain cards at certain times, and they, then they kind of fall off. I mean, there are some cards which are super powerful that don't see play, and then suddenly they'll come into the meta and then they'll go out for a couple of months and so on and so forth. And again, to use an example of that at the moment is Unseen Elder. Unseen Elder is like uh, seeing significant increase in play rate uh, in this patch and Dagon is seeing a massive reduction. The Dagon is obviously uh, related to the Harpies. Um, but, you know, Dagon's, I think, actually, if I had to say something that probably um, would fulfill the criteria for this question, it's probably Dagon. There are some metas where Dagon has been super prevalent, but his win rates have been really very low. Um, and there are others where his uh, win rate has been very high and he hasn't been prevalent in the meta at all. Um, Dagon's really polarizing. And uh, you know, as a development team, him and Harold are probably, for many reasons, the most problematic leaders for us to, to think about and deal with. Hmm. Uh, he, here's one that I'm actually a little curious about, which is that uh, what happened with Trio and Brave Effects? Like, why were they removed from the game? Did they just kind of not really work out in the way that they were hoping for? I think, you know, um, sometimes people say that we, you know, don't listen to our community. And I think, you know, it, it, it's really quite frustrating when we hear that. I mean, the Brave mechanics is something that generally our community didn't really like. Um, because in some ways it maybe exacerbated uh, turn advantage and some other factors in the game as well, um, and therefore we, you know, we looked at it and kind of removed it um, because it just wasn't really, you know, our players didn't seem like they enjoyed this mechanic. So, you know, we were hoping it would work out quite differently, and it and it didn't. Um, and in terms of uh, so, what, which was the other mechanics when you said uh, trio and brave? Yeah, I mean, tw trio is. Um, I think it's just overcomplicating things. And with Rose, it became quite frustrating because um, this was actually a tech-related issue. We couldn't really make trios work across different rows. It didn't really make a lot of huh. sense. So um, it had a whole bunch of problems with it. And so therefore, you had to be on the same row, which had its own frustrations. And uh, therefore, it just didn't really work as a mechanic that we liked. We, again, on paper, it sounded like it was super awesome and would work out really well. And it just didn't really... You know, people didn't, in many cases, didn't really enjoy it. So it's then kind of possible that Shio you know, maybe could possibly come back uh, when tech limitations are reduced? Uh, I mean, it, it could do, but I really don't think it will. I think it's mm. more of a, a single-player mechanic. And you actually would have seen it in the recent holiday event for um, for um, Mahakame Ale Festival. The trolls used it, and it, yeah. it works very well in scenarios like that. And, and you know, it, with players, I think... You know, um, it's super easy to disrupt that stuff as well. So unless you put it in Skelliger, the chances of you probably pulling it off are pretty much probably about zero or very <laughs> unlikely, let's say. Maybe you, uh, maybe if you do something with Hensalt, it's possible. But, uh, you know, it's just I don't think a mechanic that worked out how we wanted to. There was a cool question, actually, or a suggestion on the subreddit today about... Uh, overdose potion on Van Hamar versus which is the other the other mage that it's on? It's on two mages, I believe. Ida, I mean, Scoyatel and Ida, yeah. So Ida and Van Hamar, and wondering whether that was something now that we have some new bronze cards that could be looked mm. into in terms of changing, such as putting Raven's Eye, for example, on Ida, Ida, because it. Uh, then can synergize quite nicely in a spell spellatel deck and give them an extra one. 
Uh, I think in general, the mage cards will probably see some evolution over time, um, because as more cards get added to the game, the you know the distribution of those uh, kind of spells or items or whatever the case may be um, becomes can become more varied. I mean, it's quite possible as well that we'll see more cards with choices like that in the future as well. I mean, right now you have Kira Mets, and I think Kira's choices probably will definitely change uh, in the future as well. Ooh. Um, but you can definitely, I think, expect more cards with more choices because one of the key problems that we have with Gwent in terms of um, variation as well is, uh, you know, in terms of representation of variety of decks is that, you know, you kind of sometimes need answers for certain things. So having cards with choices, obviously, just by nature, leads to variety because you can adapt to different situations. So, um you know, I, I'm a really big fan personally of cards like Monster Nest and the design of those. Monster Nest obviously has a lot of choices on it, and maybe not not all cards should have so many choices. But uh, definitely seeing more cards like that and like mages is is something that will be there in the future. I mean, you know, that's not to say every card will be like that because that would obviously be silly. But uh, you know, there definitely will be more. Uh, another question we had earlier was about the. Uh, time limit per turn and whether that would be increased uh, at the po maybe at the point at which you play a card for example because some cards have a lot of chaining um, and sometimes you might find that you're sitting thinking and trying to work out your best play but at the point at which you start actually playing which would you know not no longer be roping then uh, you run out of time and then it just randomly kind of decides what to do and can often be quite costly mm -hmm. is this something that CDPR are looking into or thinking about making any adjustments to um, I think this is, the way I'm going to answer this question is basically why some people uh, misinterpret how I communicate things sometimes. I mean, and basically we already, we give you a, a whole bunch of time already to make your decisions. And, um, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't have enough time to make the decision, then that's part of the game. I mean, if we, you know, if we uh, made it so that you, um, gained extra time every time you did an interaction, there will be players that will just do that on purpose. And no, uh, yeah, as, <laughs> as you all well know. So it, it really just, you know, things like that suck because it would be super cool to do that for people that genuinely need it. But if we do, then everybody will just take advantage of it. Uh, not everybody, obviously, that's a, an exaggeration, but there are people that will, and therefore it will make the general experience for players worse. And, you know, uh, we actually used to have in the game a shorter turn timer and the majority of players were fine with that. It, actually, I can't remember. I think it's, it used to be 45 seconds at one point and it was actually really, the game played very fast and was generally, uh, you know, super exciting like that as well. So um, I think the, the amount of time that you have is, is quite fair. And the fact that it plays the card randomly for you is actually better because it, we could just, you know, it was a conscious choice to make it just finish the interaction to be a bit more generous to the player because we could just cancel it out and do nothing and then it would be much worse for you. Ooh. <laughs> Someone is asking about transferring an account from console to PC, but I think on Xbox you can already do that if you get Gwent through the Xbox game store or something. Uh, it's this Windows 10 UWP version. So um, the UWP version is shared between Xbox and PC in terms of whether you can merge an account or, or not uh, across PC and um, uh, console. That's Honestly, that's not really in my area. Um, and if somebody has a question like that, they really should just co uh, contact our support team. Sounds good. Someone else is asking. I think last time Berja was here, he teased about uh, voice lines where if you play a card and another card is on the board, for example, Triss and Yennefer, that mm -hmm. they say something different. So kind of special voice lines or interactive voice lines. Is this something that we can expect to see in the future or do you have anything that you can tell us about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have a, we've got the recording done for that. We have done it for some time. It's, um, you know, there are just other things that are a priority right now. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, players will see some of the, the fruition of the stuff we've been working on and then doing, you know, really nice kind of polishy things like this is something that will come later. So I think, you know, we're, we're pretty committed to doing it. Just uh, there isn't really a time of when that will happen. <laughs> Leaks. For <laughs> 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 uh, 
Oh dear. The problem is when they all spam this, I then have to scroll really far to try and find the other questions that people were asking. I mean, I, I can give like a half leak. I can tell which faction the card uh, Bouger released the other day was from. Oh, the not the one that's him, the one of the girl uh, yeah, that was shown at the end of the Ada, yeah. It's Ada. For those that might not know, Ada is actually Foltest's daughter. And oh, she isn't she the one that got turned into a? Or she she got turned into a. Th I read this book. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's, a, she's so it's the very first book, first short, short story. Yeah, the very first short story, and I read it. Yeah, okay. Same. So what? So what? <laughs> Ada is actually a Northern Realms card. Oh, so that's surprising. Full test daughter being. <laughs> well, she 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 also she also is kind of a monster though, if you think about it as well. So uh, you know, a natural jump probably would be to basically make her a monster uh, character, but she's not. She's a Northern Realms. Hmm. Yeah, you're getting book spoilers, chat. Sorry. So I mean, if you look at if you look at the two Northern Realms cards we've released, they're you know quite different visually from a lot of other Northern Realms cards. What's the other one? The, the, one, right the one in the middle of the screen oh, right now. This one. Yeah. The leak. Well, it's the sword again. Wait, hang on one second. Where is it? You're not very good at this, wait, are you? Hang on. Wait. It's right here. Okay. Hail. Sorry. That was. I like how you pointed the wrong direction. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, this one. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. It, yeah, no. It's yeah, yeah. Does it have a name? Are we allowed to know what it's called? Uh, for now, it's referred to as cursed weapon. Oh. Cursed weapon. Oh, well, it's, it's actually secretly a Skellige card. No, it's it's really not. It's, it's oh. cursed. So shell skull. Oh, does that mean if you like stole skull and then you're in Northern Realms, you could just pull your cursed weapon? Does it gonna have a cursed tag just in case that, oh, that sort of thing happens? Can Skell I mean, pull necromancy? Uh, I think he only pulls bronzes, does he not? I can't remember. No, no, Skell Skell pulls Skell can pull silvers. Ah, uh, then I believe he should do yes. Hmm. Oh man, I love these kind of like weird tag interactions that happen with like other factions. This is why some kind of new game mode might be fun. I don't know if that's what the new game is going to be, but if it, if you have these kind of situations where you're playing other cards, it's going to get crazy. Well, Are I can we tell gold? you, I can tell you that in the new game mode that you may have access to more than four golds. Ooh. Well, that's very. Would explain the uh, like the sage being a little bit uh, better for the new game mode. Oh, uh, well, I mean, that doesn't just mean that you can generate them from other cards. I mean, in your deck, well, yeah. you might have more than four. Well, just to clarify. Someone asked if we're going to see cross-faction cards. So I guess, like you were saying, Ada could have been a monster. So I guess the idea there would have been her being part of two factions. Uh, it's something that we've considered, but uh, it's not something that we're thinking about doing uh, for the near future. It is possible, like really long term, that we might make it so that you uh, could have cross-faction cards. But I really not for any foreseeable uh, kind of future. Hmm. Just seeing if we've got any more questions here. If anyone else has any questions, you've got to get them in now. This is your, your one and only chance for the, well, for the time being. <laughs> yeah. It's your one and only chance we, to ask them questions. We, 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 we do like to do these um these Wrath has themed talk shows. Uh, <laughs> Pretty, pretty, pretty much like w w once a major patch, optimally. So it you know mm -hmm. you, you'll you'll have additional opportunities. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm I can definitely can drop by around the time we do the next patch for sure. A lot of people are spamming Mulligan Bug question mark. Uh, What's your I what? Mean, what? How do you how do you respond? What's your answer? <laughs> my response is, what do they mean? Well, that's kind of for us to guess, right? I mean, they're not they're not asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the mulligan in general is something that players... Uh, uh, there, there are certain things in the game that players might want to work in a certain way, like, and, and therefore they report it as a bug. And I'll use an example of that that's in the game at the moment from Yorveth. So Yorveth buffs Yaven if he's in your hand, right? Yeah. Uh, that's not a bug. But players assume it's a bug because it's a negative for them and it's a drawback and they only in this case they want it to be a positive which is maybe it's very reasonable and maybe it can and it should work like that but there it isn't a right or wrong in this case it's just 
different ways of it working and our mulligan in general works the intended way we did some like i talked about before um i think the last time i was on the show we did actually do some changes to it and um we changed the way the cards are inserted into the deck and it actually works in a way where it doesn't actually replicate the behavior that the majority of players are saying that it does i mean you know, there are sometimes questions saying that uh, you know they would prefer if we shuffled the entire deck, but that also has its own fair share of issues and actually breaks a lot of interactions that we've purposely kind of built into the game already. You know, any card that's put into the bottom of the deck doesn't make sense anymore because you've just shuffled the deck every time a card is mulliganed. Um, so, you know, for now, um, as far as we can see, you know, things are working how they're intended. And you know, the, the, if people refer back to this, uh, there's this really awesome in- infographic. I, I don't actually know the guy who made that, but it was uh, really informative. That infographic isn't actually how the mulligan works anymore. It was changed based upon that whole discussion to make it like kind of, let's say, not replicate the issue in the way players didn't want it to occur. Yeah, we remember the issue was to do with, I think, sequencing and how the cards get put back into the deck before you finish the mulligan or something along those lines, and thus it could create situations where certain cards, if you mulliganed them earlier, were more, more likely to be seen again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is a good question. It says, this is, can we expect support for content creators in the game client? But I want to preface this by saying that CDPR are actually pretty good at supporting content creators already. Like They often will provide us with kegs. They provided... Uh, card reveals you know this time around swim for example got to reveal a card i know merchant had one life coach had one uh big beard had one like they, they do also give community members cards to reveal which then you know pushes views or an audience towards those content creators so it's, it's worth prefacing this by saying that uh i think cdpr are already quite good at you know interacting with content creators i mean breath is here now for example um and you know helping us out uh, I think in general, it's something that we can always do better, but uh, you know that, that's not to say um, that we're doing anything bad or anything, but I, I definitely think that there'll be some more um, projects that are kind of made in conjunction with content creators in the future in many ways. Some of those are you know eSport related, some of those are um, you know just other kinds of content and so on. and uh, you know it, it, if the question is for some people, the question might be more related to like modding and such. And you know, generally, we don't really plan to to support modding in the game uh, as a company. I mean, players can mod the game and the visuals if they wish, but it's not something that we want to provide support for in the client. It, it doesn't really make a lot of sense in many ways for us to do that. Um, and but in you know, so depending on how you take the question, uh, you know, they they're kind of different. It's um, Mod support isn't really something that we, uh, uh, you know, officially um, can support, but we don't. We're not denying it either. There's deck trackers out there, and so on and so forth, and those aren't against uh, any rules or anything that we have. Um, but in terms of supporting content creators, yeah, I mean, you know, as a company, we're learning. This is our kind of first, uh, you know, um, major free-to-play title, and uh, you know, as time goes, things will definitely improve for sure. So going back to Mulligan Bud, Delta Scrape says, when I play Bran, I always blacklist Mokfog, Ceres, etc. Yet when I open with Bran, they are always on top of my deck. I think that's just a visual that's thing. Bran. Yeah, that's Bran, yeah, that's a visual thing. Like, it's, when it's you Mulligan of... with Bran, it shows your Mulligans wander at the start, but they're not actually at the start. Yes, or they're not actually yes, at the top of your deck. That's, that's correct. So that's not actually, there's not, it's not a mulligan situation at all. It's just visually they're shown near the, the start, but then that's not actually the order of your deck. Yeah, it's just a visual bug. <clears throat> uh, there's, a, there's been a few questions about Queen's Guards I've seen. I mean, I, I talked on it before. Um, I talked before about uh, graveyard hate in general. I mean, it's a really, that's a really difficult problem to deal with because, you know, if we made it so that Queen's Guards couldn't be affected by any cards, then in many ways they might be too good. Um, so, you know, there's definitely something to look at with Queen's cards. They're not seeing the play rate that we want from them. Um, not, you know, not ready to commit to any answers about uh, how we plan to, to solve that. But we, you know, we like Queen's cards as a general deck uh, idea and, uh, you know, we'd like it to, to work better in the future as well, for sure. 
Nice. I like Skellige. So that sounds pretty good. <laughs> uh, what was I going to... It was a question I was going to ask. Oh, this one is about um, CDPR licensed tournaments. So we have Gwent uh, Mania. Is that called Gwent Mania? Yeah. No, Gwent Slam. Gwent Slam? Gwent Slam, yeah. That's Gwent what Slam. it is. Gwent Mania is the other one by Life Coach. Gwent Slam 3 <laughs> has its qualifiers announced for this weekend. So that you guys don't know and you want to participate in Gwent Slam three there is qualifiers saturday and sunday i believe but the question is uh can we expect to see other people or organizations other than life coach getting involved with uh licensed tournaments uh i'm not really involved in the esports stuff so unfortunately I, I can't really answer that stuff i mean um i think in general the uh you know as a company we definitely want to support that stuff it's uh you know obviously it's a very complex issue and uh, anybody that, that's interested in that should uh, definitely contact our PR people related to it. We should chat with Raphael at some point. He's in charge of esports, I think. Uh, true, but I think uh, I'm not sure it's so easy. To, uh, I don't think it, there's a direct line of communication to him um, in that same kind of sense. I think you know if people have questions, you know, generally as a company, you go to the PR guys first, and you know, and they should pass on the you know things to the relevant people. Sounds good. Sounds good. So. Just so if anyone's asking esports questions, just know that that is the case. Because we've had a few and I've been kind of avoiding them because you said previously that you're not that involved in that side of things. No, I, I'm honestly really not. I mean, um, you know, I, I know our guys are, you know, I am, they're really trying, uh, do, putting in a lot of work. We have a great events team that, uh, that you know, the Challenger was uh, something we were really proud of. And uh, hopefully the next Challenger people will really enjoy uh, the Open as well, obviously. Challenger is a bit, you know, larger in scale, obviously. So hopefully people will really enjoy uh, uh, what we have planned. All right. Well, it looks like uh, chat has for the most part devolved into uh the same spammed questions Chat so never devolves <laughs> <clears throat> so uh i i believe uh this is where we're going to call it uh we've you know had had it going for two and a half hours uh thanks very much rethaz uh for being on uh, it's it's really great that you guys are you know doing uh, you you have a real presence in the community and you guys are you know are not afraid to you know voice your opinions uh, and communicate with us very well. Yeah, it's been good, especially yeah. sticking around an extra hour answering questions. Normally we finish an hour earlier than this, so it's been really fantastic. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I've said it before, but I I don't think I've seen another video game company go out into their community to the level the CD Projekt Red does, and it is definitely appreciated. I oh, know it's, it's a pleasure to always talk to you guys, and uh, you know, this is the first time I've spoken to you, uh, Jagras. It's a, it's a pleasure, and uh, you know, I look forward to the next time. Uh, definitely by the, uh, when the next kind of major patch comes out, I'll be sure to drop by. It's been fantastic. Do you have any shout-outs that you'd like to Ooh. give? Uh, just I, I want to say in general to you know that I'm super uh, proud and really happy with the, the whole Gwen team. They they you know I know that some players might not be happy with certain things, but uh, you know the team really do work exceptionally hard and they put their heart and their soul into to making this uh, game. You know uh, hopefully something players can really be happy uh, with and, and really enjoy. And uh, you know I just like to give a shout to all their dedicated work and that extends to you know all the all the other teams that are not just developing the the PR guys like uh, you know uh, Pavel is a, is a legend and really is putting himself out there and doing a huge amount of work and engaging with the community and you know he's not just there for leaks he's he's there for many things <laughs> but, uh, you know they they they're really su everyone's super hard working and uh, I'm really happy to to work with all of them Dale any shout outs uh, as always, I'd like to shout out the official Gwent communities. Uh, you can check out the official subreddit over at gwent.reddit.com. From there, you can find a link to the uh, official Gwent Discord. I believe there's also a link floating around there for the Ask Gwent Discord, which is another excellent community for, especially if you're newer to the game and you just want to ask a question about Gwent and get an answer back. It's a really great way of doing so. Um, also, if you want to get to the official forums, there are official forums. I know that they're overlooked sometimes, I think a little bit too much, but definitely check those out as well if you're looking to try and get uh, more of a communication directly with CDPR. Um, also, quick shout out for our Gwendolyn's Open Harvest presented by uh, Matthew J. Clorty. It is coming up and signups are open. You can check those out over at gwendolyn.com slash TGO. It's your last chance to get 
an opportunity to qualify for the Gwendolyn's Open Champions uh, closed tourney, which is going to be at the end of this year. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. And I'd personally like to give a shout out uh, to community member, the Pabs, uh, who made the uh, the league asset we just we just uh, we just had quickly up on the stream. Uh, he 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 does a lot of uh, community photoshops, including one of me on Duragra. You might have seen. Oh, that one was good. And I I always shout out someone in chat. And last week I told uh, Geralt of Nivea that I would shout him out if he came back, and he did come back this week. So shout outs to Geralt of Nivea. If you want to be, actually, you know what? I'm not even going to say ask me to shout you out because that's not going to happen. If you're back next week, you might be the lucky Jagger shout out. So therefore, you, <laughs> <laughs> you win literally nothing, but you know that that's what you get. Last week was, I think, uh, Burka. This week, Geralt of Nivea. Could you be number three? Find out next week on the Gwentzman Talk Show. Oh my god! <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye guys. Oh, this is awkward. Just keep waving. <laughs> <laughs>